rouva prezidentti. Monsieur le membre honorable du Parlement européen, directors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends of space, welcome to the European Space Week plenary session. How do you feel? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have a personal question for you at the beginning. How many of you, when you were children, were dreaming of becoming astronauts? How many of you? Wow, that's the majority. How many of you still dream to become astronauts? As many, that is fantastic. How many of you dream to one day be able to travel to space? Okay, you are the very important people of this event, the VIPs, because at the end of these plenary sessions today and tomorrow, I want everybody to be as excited about space as much as you are very, very, very promising space travelers. Ladies and gentlemen, over the next few days, or the next couple of days, this plenary session, tomorrow's plenary session, we'll be talking about some very exciting topics related to space. The sustainability of space, the sustainability of Europe, and actually the sustainability of our future, and how space plays a fundamental role in this. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is André Noël Chaker, and yes, I'm a Finnish citizen, just to let you know. And my pleasure is here to welcome you to this house of workers. This is the house of workers, one of the most famous house of workers in the country. So I will tell you simply, let's just enjoy this wonderful space and get to work. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we are delighted to have you here at Passi Torni, and we would like you to be as active as possible in spreading the word about the European space program. Our hashtag today is hashtag EUSW2019, hashtag EUSW2019. Please be active. We are also live on, on, the, on the live stream. Tell your friends in your countries that space is the next frontier. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great honor and pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker today. She is a very well known in this neighborhood, and she is also the former president of the Republic of Finland. It is with great honor and pleasure that I welcome President Tarja Halonen to the stage. Welcome. So, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's also my great pleasure to welcome you to my home, hometown and uh, my, the area which is very much also my home since I was a child. So, um, it's, it's very great honor to speak to you today at the European Space Week. So, space exploration, the human quest to discover the unexplained or unknown, and the will to seek for answers to understand the universe has sparked the fascination of many, many uh, for centuries. This summer, at the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission, and the day when the first humans set their foot on other planet, we all have recalled that the beginning of the space age was not only a dangerous and costly and fantastic effort, but it portrayed a further extension of the human effort to learn more about the universe and of itself. The adventurous space flight Images about the stars and the faraway galaxies trigger curiosity away um, for the technology development and the human endeavors dating back to the early seafarers. However, space is not only fascinating or imaginary. It is practical and it is useful. It's not far away, but it's, in the matter of fact, very close. We are there. So, 
space technology and its applications not only allow us to observe our own blue planet, but, uh, planet, but help us in our everyday lives, enabling us to find our way in the city, to communicate and to connect, and to make us more safe, and I hope also to, in a more sustainable way. So, in fact, uh, we have become so dependent on these space-based services that uh, their unavailability would cause serious societal and economical consequences, and we would notice it quite, quite fast. However, there is more to be said in this regard. Space applications have a crucial role in ensuring the sustainable future of our planet by providing us with information and knowledge, the ability to prevent and to act, um, the possibility to take care. This is a topic of today and tomorrow's plenary sessions, sustainable space, sustainable Europe, sustainable future. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sustainable economic growth, social equality, and environmental responsibility are interdependent. Already a quarter century ago, the so-called uh, very famous Brundtland Report called for a new paradigm of sustainable development, a pattern of development that meets the needs of the present, ours, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The same holds true in the space context. While we have to ensure that the present generation may use and enjoy the benefits of peaceful space exploration, this has to be done in a responsible manner to guarantee that the future generations will have the same possibilities. The benefits of space exploration also act, or let's see, currency could act as a drivers for sustainable growth and provide tools to tackle societal and global challenges on Earth. Space activities provide information for more informed and integrated policy making. This is, for example, with regards to the climate change where space applications provide invaluable data for the purposes of monitoring changes in the environment and reacting to natural disasters. Importantly, uh, space technology and its applications are also instrumental for the economic development of less developed and remote regions providing, just for example, new means of connectivity, fostering economic empowerment, tele-education reaching more children in remote areas, as well as access to healthcare through telemedicine applications profoundly impacting these regions and enabling the equal participation in the digital society. And if I say in humble way that now you are in the country which is one of the largest in the European Union, only for 5.5 million people. So consequently, we can all underscore the importance of space science and technology for the achievement of the goals and targets set by the global development agenda. What I know and you know, and I'm also guilty for them working from the since millennium goals and SDGs throughout, and I'm still there. Just you can say that we are not effective enough, but we try. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, in order to enhance the sustainable development on Earth, we have to take care of the space environment. Already today, the proliferation of orbital debris and increased risk of collisions and interference may affect the sustainability of, the, of space activities. We must secure that space remains suitable for peaceful use and exploration. We cannot just rely on opportunities that using space can offer to protect our planet. We need equally protect the space environment. So, a major achievement to this effect was reached this summer when the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPUS, adopted the guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities after 10 years of hard work 
and I think a lot of discussions. These non-legally binding guidelines aim to provide a set of best practices to steer the behavior of space actors towards a desired objective, the sustainability of space activities. Um, the adoption by these guidelines by COPUS proves that multilateral space diplomacy can work and produce results. But uh, some of you already know that uh, I'm, I'm a, I have a law background. So we should not, however, stop here, uh, but continue to address the emerging issues as well as encourage wide national implementation measures of these already adopted 21 guidelines. And perhaps in the future, we can make it and also the SDGs more legally binding but it's just between us. So, our, um, on our way to more sustainable future, I must stress the importance of international collaboration. Space is a common good, but also an infinitive resource. A continuous dialogue in multilateral fora, amongst us Europeans, amongst our global partners, provides the best possibilities for fruitful and effective international cooperation, coordination, and information sharing. All necessities in ensuring the peaceful use and exploration of outer space. But we must work together amongst all the actors, states, intergovernmental, non-governmental organizers, and the private sector entities, academia, and in fulfilling the goals of sustainable development. And as I already confess, my, my background is in law. Uh, so, and that is uh, easy for me to subscribe the idea of the rule-based international order, bringing predictability and creating conditions for tackling global problems, to use and uh, to explore our out space for the benefit and interest of all countries. The province of making together, we also have the common rules. This is at all levels. But of course, even as a former lawyer, I had to confess that the political will, the free will of the people is the basics. So United Nations treaties on outer space are the cornerstone of the international space law and together with the different voluntary instruments create the basis for the regulation of international space activities. While um, the non-legally binding instruments created to tackle the pressing issues of today, such as uh, space uh, debris mitigation, currently represent the best way forward. Continuous efforts should be made in the furthering development of international legal framework in order to avoid and overcome uncertainty and fragmentation in the regulation of inherited global space activities. And there is not unlimited time for that. Please try to press all your people in your countries to do it sooner than later. So I'm very happy to see this event, of course, being hosted by Finland, even though Finland is a quite new space-faring state with the first Finnish satellites only launched in recent years. But now you have a very good possibility to see those who have done it. I mean, it can be historical. So, uh, Finland is, has, anyway, the substantial experience in space science, technology, and applications, and Finland has participated in international space collaboration, in particular with its European partners, already for several dec decades. So, building on this background, there is an increasing interest in space activities in Finland by a variety of actors, namely, Space education and outreach continues to attract students at univers university level, where I'm the chair of this Helsinki University, while the top level space science and research is carried out in many research institutes, which together with an active private sector, create innovation and investments. So um, this all facilitates uh, growing public interest in space activities, and I'm very happy that uh, youth is, uh, is uh, on board and, and also, also the uh, uh, boys and girls, I hope that this is really 
a fascinating world of science, technology, and in mathematics. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I believe that this event here in Helsinki will prove us all the importance of the space activities in helping to foster sustainable development, to tackle global challenges and regional, including Arctic, where you are close now, but also an Arctic area, and to further international collaboration for our common good. I will say only very shortly that, uh, that sometimes the way to get this kind of the cooperation takes time. Um, as I have already mentioned that it has taken with you. But I still remember when it was already a long, quite a long time ago, in 1999. I remember when I met my, my colleagues, I was in that time the foreign minister of this country. I met my, my colleagues in Antarctic because we were celebrating the freedom of the science in Antarctic area for 40 years. And now this is almost an quarter of the century after that, or at least 19 years after that. So um, if you live long, you will see the splendid future. I hope all the best for you. I hope also an interesting event and a lot of, lot of personal contacts. As you know, in international conferences, it's, it's very important to try to listen to us who are speaking here, but uh, the coffee breaks, as, uh, they are as important because then you will create a real, real working network. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, for their, those inspiring words about collaboration, rule of law, and the freedom. And the freedom. That, that was, that was the, the key. I, I've never seen that happen at one of your speeches, Madam President. But ladies and gentlemen, it's with great honor that I introduce our next keynote speaker who is actually quite fascinating to me. He's, a, he's an author, and I love authors since I love writing myself. He's the author of 15 books, one of which I absolutely need to read now. But uh, this year, he's a freshly minted member of the European Parliament. His link to space is that he is the vice coordinator of the E3 committee charged with space, the shadow rapporteur of the space program of the European Union, Please give a warm welcome to the member of the European Parliament, Christophe Grudler. Bienvenue. Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to, to be here with you uh, for, the, for this European Space Week plenary. And I am glad to represent the European Parliament. Uh, next Friday, uh, Mrs. President, uh, it will be the Independence Day here in Finland, as I remember. Uh, it's a good sign on a good week to speak together about Europe's special independence. Space uh, technologies, data, and services have become indispensable uh, in the daily lives of many European citizens. The, the European Air Observation System, Copernicus, as you know, is already helping to save lives on, at sea and improving our, our response to natural disasters. These data are also used by farmers for crop monitoring, on yield forecasting, and for monitoring oil spills on ships. The Galileo navigation system, more accurate than the American GPS system, provides accurate and reliable positioning and time measurement information for anyone equipped with a Galileo compatible device, but also for autonom autonomous and connected vehicles, railways, and aviation. EGNOS provides positioning information so accurate that it is used at 350 airports around the world. Last September, 
Galileo reached one billion smartphone users worldwide. Despite this huge success, we should work together with the European Commission and the other agencies involved to create awareness among the European citizens, which still do not know the enormous potential of the EU space sector and the great contribution it can give to our daily lives. These technologies also play an essential role in preserving our interest on strategic autonomy. Europe's space program has a long-standing competitive advantage. As a member of the European Parliament, sitting on the ITRI Committee and Shadow Rapporteur on the future European space program, space issues will be one of the priorities of my mandate, and I will fight to ensure that it, this program is sufficiently funded in the next MFF. The purpose uh, of the space regulation is for the European Union to be a leading international player and to encourage competitiveness of the sector of the space sector industries within the Union, in particular small and medium-sized enterprises, startups and innovative business businesses. The space program will ensure investment continuity in AU space activities. It will also exploit the growing possibilities that space offers for the security of Europeans, including by making the most of synergies between the civilian and the defense sectors. It will consolidate all AU space activities into a single regulation. This program also includes new security components. GovSatcom will provide the member states and AU security actors with guaranteed access to secure satellite communications and the improvement of the pilot project on space surveillance and tracking of objects in orbit, as we say, SSA, to, to prevent play, uh, space collisions and uncontrolled entry of space objects into the ASS atmosphere. Finally, uh, the space program provides for an unified and simplified governance system between the Commission, the European Space Agency, and the, Europeans, uh, the, the European GNS Agency, will we become the European Union Agency for the Space Programme. This programme proposed to rationalise and simplify, simplify the methods of cooperating between all institutional actors within, without fundamentally changing the balance of responsibilities. And now, Parliament position. Uh, Parliament position uh, focused on, on simplifying space governance, improving the allocation of responsibilities, increasing the space budget, inclusion of downstream markets, of course, safeguarding GovSatcom, bolstering the AU space diplomacy, and promoting AU technology and industry. We supported uh, an overall budget of 16.9 billion euro, 0 0.9 more than the Commission proposal for the period 2021 to 2027. With the following educative breakdown, Galileo Egnos 9.7 billion, Copernicus 6 billion, SSI GovSatcom 1.2 billion. Regarding the, the budget, we have been uh, notified that the new MFF negotiating box proposed by uh, Council of Europe 
uh, European Council, sorry, forces a cut of 1.7 billion of euro for the space program. Defunding our budget in the upcoming negotiation will be for us extremely important. As a matter of fact, an ambitious budget will be the only way to ensure Europe's global leadership on strategic autonomy. Major investments by the EU have enabled progress that no member state could have achieved on its own. Europe manufactures one third of the satellites produced in the world. Galileo and Copernicus have become global references in the field of satellite positioning on Earth observation. The European space industry is one of the most competitive in the world. It employs over uh, two, 230,000 professionals and generates a value added estimated uh, at uh, 53 uh, to 62 billion. The emergence of new actors and the development of new technologies are revolutionizing traditional industries, industrial models. The AU space activities still have untapped potential that could help us to meet these challenges, whether through observation, navigation, or telecommunication. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Crudler. Thank you for the wonderful opening on the importance of space for Europe and how the investments made in Europe are now ensuring the global leadership of Europe in the space industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I was very happy to hear Mr. Grunler's mention of the Independence Day of Finland on Friday. On Friday, Finland will be 102 years old. For its 100th anniversary, the highlight of the, one, of, one of the highlights of the anniversary was actually Finland's very first satellite, Alto-1. Interestingly enough, there was another satellite launched by a Finnish university, but their first one was not under a Finnish flag, it was under a Belgian flag, interestingly enough. And so it's only appropriate that our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is from Belgium. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to, to present you yet another lawyer on stage, the Deputy Director General of the European Commission for DG Grow in charge of defense and space policy. Monsieur Pierre Delso, bienvenue. Thank you very much and thanks for rem reminding me the role of Belgium in space. We are, actually, you are laughing, but we, you know, Belgium is a small country, but if you look at the contribution of uh, Belgium to space, it's not so de minimis, I would say. So we are proud of what we do. But most seriously, good afternoon to all of you and uh, to everybody in this room, of course. I'm not going to quote all the important person, VIP people who are here. But to come back to maybe to one of the points you make, uh, the moderator make. What I liked about this week's, this week, sorry, is the fact actually that you can meet real people. You know, it's nice to have pe old people like me giving a speech and uh, talking about, you know, what we do and so on. But what is really interesting during this week is a possibility for all of you, uh, SME, startups, uh, innovators, people who simply believe in space, to talk to each other, to meet and to progress and to develop things. Because that's exactly what we need in Europe. We need innovation. We need people who are active, who really have ideas and want to implement them. You know, we had a discussion. We have a lot of startups in Europe. We need those startups to become real big players in the world. 
That's possible. Why would it not be possible in Europe when, when it's possible elsewhere? Of course, I know all the difficulties and so on. But so my point is, what really matters about space, it's not what people like me say, it's what you do with space. And that's something which is fundamental and will be extremely important for all of us. So that's my first message. Second message is, yes, we have achieved a lot. It's true, we should be proud of what we have done. But let's be very clear. If we don't continue to invest in space, if we don't continue to attract a lot of bright people working in the space sector, simply we will be lagging behind the rest of the world in five, 10, 20 years' time. So that's why decisions like, you know, the money which will be allocated to the EU space program are important. And if we don't take the appropriate decision now, we know one thing for sure, that most of the space sector will go elsewhere in the future. Not now, not in one year, not in two years' time, but in five and ten years' time. And from this point of view, I must congratulate Jan, he's not listening because he's playing with his device, but I must congratulate Jan Werner for the success of the ESA ministerial, because it shows at least that member states have realized that it's important to invest in space and to put the appropriate amount of money. Now, I hope that the Finnish presidency and all the EU member states will understand that they should do also the same with the EU space program. So, you know, not the money only for Jan and for ESA, but also for the EU space program, I believe it's important, you know. And anyway, the money we will get will also go to ESA. So it just, it's a, it's a common exercise and I believe that's important. So my message, my second message is, we should be proud of what we have done, but if we simply do not continue to invest, mass, invest massively and to work massively in the space sector, we'll be nowhere. The third message is, and I keep, probably many of you have already heard me saying it many times, but I really believe in it. The space sector is fascinating. It's great. You are great people. But what we need is also to break the silos and to go outside. You know, breaking the walls. You know, I'm an old man. I still remember the song, Breaking the Walls. We need to break the walls. We need to make, to make the space sector more attractive for people outside of the space sector. And probably what we need also is for the space sector to look at what's happening outside of the space sector. Uh, sector. Because when you talk about the new space, you know, one characteristic of the new space, I know some people don't like the expression, and I agree, new space is probably not the right word, but certainly one thing which is sure, that those investing doing new, the so-called new space are simply applying methods and technologies and way to work which exist in other sectors. So space sector is important, but also we need to look at what's happening outside. Fourth message, I'm a lawyer, so I, I don't know how to count, but I believe that the fourth uh, message. The, the fourth message is basically we as a commission, we want to continue to invest, we want to continue in our program, and I don't need to repeat what the members, Mr. Grudler has said, the members of the parliament has said. We want to continue to invest and we want to develop new programs, new, new components of the space program. And actually even to show the importance that the commission attach, attaches to the space sector, today the commission has decided the creation of a new director general for defense industry and space. Now, I know the world, the real world, does not exist because of the commission division, you know. Clearly, it's not fundamental for the rest of the world, but it shows at least one thing that from a commission point of view, for the new commission, space is a very important sector. That's the only point, maybe. That's the only message, but it's a fundamental one. We believe, we continue to, be, to believe that space is fundamental, not only for itself, but also for the rest and for the other sectors of the economy. And when we talk about, and we will see today now, actually the next panel, when we talk about the priority of protecting our environment, what we need to do to, to, to be more green, space is a very important element, a very important factor in this. And my last message, and then I will finish because I told you, you are the most interesting part, not me. My last message is, when we talk about the space sector and when we talk about solutions, like for instance, what we want to do to protect the environment, we should always accept the idea that the space sector is not the only solution but should be part of the solution. So in other words, space should be integrated with other types of technology, but if we are able to have space with, combined with other types of technology, 
we certainly can achieve a lot of important goals that we need, all need to, to achieve for simply to protect our Earth. Thank you very much, and I wish you a good week. Merci, Monsieur Delso, and thank you for those important insights on investments, breaking the silos, technology, and commission governance. And I would also like to thank Belgium for personally inspiring me as a child in space. My first contact to space in literature was, of course, Tintin sur la Lune. Of course. Thank you to Belgium once again. <laughs> voilà. <laughs> voilà. Merci. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this exciting video about space solutions that will strengthen Europe, Europe's position as a global leader in climate action. Let's take a look at this. Hey, Vienna. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you our first keynote speaker in this particular section, the this, this section on how these great new solutions will help us strength, strengthen the European position in fighting climate, climate change. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is a very in, impressive man, a global citizen, very active in the tech scene here in Finland. Actually, their company, Cloud Asset, is an award-winning fintech company, but it seems to be taking over many other areas involving AI and the Internet of Things. A visionary of technology, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of Cloud Asset, Hassan Malik. Um, hi everyone, so thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I want to start with a story first. So just before the session started, the screw on these spectacles came out and the arm fell out. And uh, Kimmo, who's our Isabic uh, mentor. Kimmo, where are you? Are you here somewhere? Yeah, there you are. All right, him and I, we, we ran and we found an optician just outside. So anyone else has trouble with spectacles? Right around the corner. <laughs> So here we are, all set. Um, thanks, Andre, for uh, the introduction. Um, and I just want to thank everyone here. It's an honor to be here uh, to address all of you. Um, and a very good afternoon. And please stay awake during my session as well. Um, so Hel Cloud Asset is a Helsinki-based startup. And uh, I moved to Helsinki in, uh, in October 2014. Uh, my wife is, is a Finn, and she said that, look, uh, the stuff you're doing, Finland is the capital of the high-tech universe, and you need to be in Helsinki. So that's exactly what we did. Moved out to, to Helsinki. Uh, I'm a British Pakistani citizen, so I don't have, like Andre, Finnish citizenship, uh, citizenship. So I don't know what happens to me uh, after the Brexit. So, so Madam President, I'm going to need your help. <laughs> Okay, so we'll, we'll swap places then. <laughs> Superb. Uh, we, we, we did this in Helsinki because Helsinki, for us, proved to be an environment where R&D and systematic adoption of technology at the infrastructure level was taking place. There are various changes happening in the Finnish uh, and Nordics fintech ecosystem space, where we position one of our platform companies called P3, and P3 is now one of the most leading uh, European fintechs. It's won awards in, in October as the most revolutionary fintech, 
uh, across the Nordics, as well as we won the award for the leading uh, European payment uh, technology uh, uh, a, a series of awards organized at an event by, by Worldline in, in, in Frankfurt. So again, being in this environment, leveraging what's happening at the infrastructure level, how technology is being fused into sort of progressing piece by piece, this really is very much the right place for us to be to leverage components from around us. Similarly, uh, our second focus area is, is, is what we call RAMP. Uh, RAMP actually stands for Resource Asset Management Platform. And that utilizes heavily on 5G technology, IoT, other types of analytics, AI, and the fusion and synthesis of data for decision support at mega scale. Um, and, 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 and being here really with, with, with today's uh, 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 you know, Finnish presidency uh, in, 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 in the space uh, arena uh, and, and, and development of companies here that are pushing out microsatellites for environmental geosensing, remote sensing and so forth and optics technology, this really was the right place for us. And, and it, was a, it was because of this baseline that the Thai government, as an example, uh, decided to work with Cloud Asset uh, when they wanted to better address water and flood disasters uh, uh, across the country. So in 2011, uh, Thailand had mega floods that disrupted the global uh, hard disk drive supply chain, as an example major impact on automotive parts. Thailand is a fabrication uh, uh, center of, of the East, as well as a sem semiconductor fa fa fabrication, but also the Detroit of the East. Bangkok has massive, and, and the Chonburi Industrial Estate has massive automotive development there. And uh, when the Thais wanted to come up with a, with a solution to how to address challenges of flood risks, they turned to us as a Finnish company that helped them develop an AI-based uh, uh, command and control capability that synthesizes and fuses in real time satellite data, data from data that is gathered from over 30,000 sensors, from over 40 ministries and agencies, and pulls everything together to create a real time situation awareness picture. That project took us five years to implement and complete. It is now running live with the Hydro Agri Informatics Institute of Thailand under the Ministry of Science and Technology. And we're very proud to be a Finnish company to have achieved that outcome. This is probably one of the first ever AI-based uh, uh, analytics platforms that actually manages water resilience, scarcity, the supply or, or lack thereof of water at a national scale and then minimizes it to a much more granular uh, a, a 10 meter by 10 meter grid. So, 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 so again, uh, you know, I moved here from Singapore. I could have done this in many locations, but really this was the environment that, uh, that gave us all of the essential tools and components that we needed to create uh, uh, such, a, such a system. We are now uh, in the age of the super data set, uh, not yet the mega data set, but the super data set. We'll move to a mega data set when we'll move to quantum computing. But with super data set, myself, uh, our team here in Helsinki, and our team members around the world, we're all convinced that it's not about the export of hard technology or specific licensed software. It's the provision of services and the consumption of services at global scale because we're addressing large super data sets that require a zoom out picture, that require a mass scale understanding of reality and understanding of environment. And this is where uh, I'll completely support what the director said earlier, that it's not just the satellite alone, but it's everything that is, that is built around that data set. But for us, the satellite plays an absolutely essential role. If it wasn't for geosensing and if it wasn't for remote sensing and, and optics and hyperspectral and multispectral technologies that allow us to see what's happening on, on, on the ground, we can't work out predictive models. And what we're doing with our technology today is working out very high resolution prediction models 
without the need to depend on classical mathematical modeling approaches. These AI engines in real time are fusing huge amounts of data and working out potential outcomes of the universe, of what happens in the next seven days or 14 days or the month uh, uh, out, and how to sort of plan and mitigate and address what's coming up next. Uh, so for us, uh, you know, the base here in Finland really made it happen for us, and we're grateful for that. Um, with this uh, zoom out and the big picture, uh, what I would say is that uh, within the European domain itself, you know, we have problems near to home. Spain uh, suffers from droughts, forest fires. Uh, in fact, uh, we're, 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 thanks to our ESA business incubation program, we're, we're, we're discussing with uh, Valencia through... Uh, through Kimmo to, to actually have a presence out there to start focusing on understanding exactly how we adapt our AI models to fl uh, fl uh, drought and, and forest fire prediction in their areas and the supply and optimum resilience and supply of water as a, as a key national resource. Uh, then of course the UK has floods and, and we see them increasing uh, more and more. Uh, localized flooding, uh, Paris heat waves, uh, uh, and, and so forth. And these challenges will only accentuate over time. I'm absolutely convinced that it is no longer uh, viable for countries to build their own homegrown capability, capacity, technology on their own. Uh, I've been talking to governments the last three and a half years, especially Southeast Asian governments and South Asian governments. They all want to do a lot of things. They have major challenges. We know there were uh, 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 weather events in, in the Philippines just a few days back. They don't have the capacity. They don't have the capability. They don't have the resource, the know-how, the concepts, or the roadmaps. That is being developed here. This country and this environment is allowing us to achieve that. We need to provide those platforms as a service. Platform as a service for consumption by governments, large enterprise, multi-state enterprise, yeah. And on top of it, individuals. Specific individuals need the right information, the right data to act and make the right decisions, our individual impact on the environment. I'm just gonna close with, uh, with, with a couple of, uh, uh, couple of pointers. As 5G networks uh, become uh, uh, commonplace over the next few years, we will have phenomenal connectivity coverage in the urban domain. Satellites provide that excellent backhaul that connect those urban centers at a ubiquitous, ubiquitous level, uh, nationally and globally, pan-region. So satellites plus 5G, essential combination. We hear that some companies are working on low orbit satellites for internet connectivity, high speed internet connectivity. This is going to create for the first time ever one of the most strongest sensing capabilities at a global scale. Um, and again, uh, you know, being here in Finland allows us to, to participate in those, those, those tracks of innovation. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, the ES ESA, and specifically ESA's business incubation uh, program. Uh, they support uh, us. They've been mentoring us for the past uh, year. They've helped us understand assets that sit within uh, the ESA, and then other uh, elements of the ecosystem in Finland that, that have allowed, allowed us to build the sorts of capabilities we've done. Satellites are going to play, uh, play a, a huge role going forward. I just want to share one example in our brainstorming session from yesterday. We were talking about climate action and how to mitigate threats. Human impact, individual impact plays a huge role. And one of the key ideas that came up with, uh, from one of our team members was that, is it possible to put a low voltage laser on all satellites? Anyone that misbehaves on climate, we zap them. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Hassan, for a very exciting presentation. Congratulations on all the prizes you have won as a company. And I can tell you, as your lawyer, is that next year you will be eligible for Finnish citizenship. You arrived in 2014, 2020 is your year. There is a, a language test, though. I, I recommend that you develop an AI chip into the brain. 
It took me 20 years to get here, but maybe as a technology person, you'll do, you'll do it much faster than me. Lady, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our, the moderator of our next panel together with his panelists. He is a fine scientist leading an amazing team of scientists from one of, one of the world's leading meteorological institutes. His team are fascinated with climate, fascinated with space. Please welcome Director General of the Finnish Meteorological Institute. You're already on stage. I am. Thank, thank you very Yuani. much, Andre. Yuani Damski. Yes, Give him a big, big hand. Yes. Yes. Madam President, honorable member of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, all the space enthusiasts, I'm very honored to be here this day. Um, I am, well, I have a simple mind, and I think that I know the solution for the climate actions. My solution is based on the four cornerstones, and I'm going to reveal three of them first before I go any further. Those are data, it's solid top-level science, and it's innovation, especially service innovations. I think that those three, with the fourth one, are the real solutions for our actions against the climate change and against the, uh, well, saving the whole planet. Um, our topic of the panel today is how can space solutions help to strengthen the Europe position as a global leader in climate action. So this is the, uh, the grand title and I'd like to now introduce the panelists to you and I'm very honored to first ask um, uh, the one uh, Andre already um, uh, introduced to you, uh, Pierre Del Sol, um, excuse my pronunciation. Uh, as Andre already told, he's the di Deputy Director General of the European Commission, DG Growth. So please, welcome. Hello. Uh, next, my privilege is to introduce you, Carlo De Dorit. Uh, he's Executive Director of the European GNSS Agency. Please welcome uh, Carlo. Very good, thank you. And next, uh, my honor is to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Florence Rabier uh, to the stage. Uh, she is the uh, Director General of the ECMWF, that is the European Center for the Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Maybe you can take the center stage there. And as you know, ECMWF is the world leader in weather forecasting. So welcome, Florence. It's very good to have you here. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Jean-Yves Legault, who is president uh, of the CNES. Uh, we are very honored to have you here, sir. Uh, welcome to the stage. Uh, our fifth panelist is uh, well known to all of us. He's Jan Werner, and as you know, he just comes with the fresh news from the ESA Ministerial. So welcome to the panel and welcome to the stage. Thank you very much for coming. Hello, sir. Yeah. And finally, uh, it is a great pleasure, and I'm very excited to introduce to you, uh, uh, Carlo, uh, sorry, um, um, oh, I'm getting behind with my cards here, uh, Thomas Lesas, who is uh, a founder of an NGO of the, um, um, no. yes. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. Yeah, you go there. Sorry. It looks as if that I'm too excited about all this. So, um, remembering the very first question, how we can uh, stay in the lead position in Europe when it comes to the uh, solutions and actions against the climate and climate change problematics. Uh, I'd like to start the panel here, and I'd like to um, first give a, a floor to um, uh, Pierre Del Sol and ask you, uh, how do you see, how can we uh, use the satellite uh, uh, technology in order to fight the climate actions? Please, the floor is yours. Or the chair. The chair. Hmm. And the mic. Yeah. No, first of all, I'm sorry for you, because I have already spoken just before, so I don't see why I should start this panel mm. anyway, because you have much more eminent specialists than I am. 
So the only message I would say is that we have developed the Copernicus prog program, which actually, when I say we have developed, it's with ESA, and uh, of course, uh, ESA play is also partly owner of the Copernicus program. It's a very important program. It's a European program, and it's on the world, and it's a world leader program. So it's something which really delivers solutions and images that no one else in the world is able to do. So we are the world leader and we use it as you, we, it will be explained to you by the real expert. We, it's already widely used now for uh, monitoring a number of things like the sea level, pollution and these kind of things. But what is even more important that what we want to do in the future and what we want to do in the future is basically launching a new mission again with ESA when say we it's uh, ESA and the European Commission we want to launch a new mission to monitor CO2 emission, and we wanted to do it quickly. We want to do it as soon as possible around 2025, launching the sat satellite. Because we believe it, we, it's an urgency, we cannot wait, and we need to do it. But to come back to one small point, for doing this, we need the money. ESA got the money at the ministerial, we still need also the money at the EU level. Because if we, wa if we say that monitoring the climate and uh, doing something against, uh, pro to protect the environment is fundamental, we need also to put the money where we say those words. Thank you stop very it. much. That's, uh, Probably Jan would have a lot of, thing, lot of <laughs> things to say on this. Yeah. Well, um, let me go uh, next to, uh, perhaps we go point by point, and uh, then we um, try to uh, figure out the whole, um, you know, um, summary, if, if this is okay. Thank you. So next, uh, Carlo, I'd like to hear your point of view from the GSA point of view. How do you see the, uh, your, uh, what can you do with all the sector that you are representing for this uh, climate action and what kind of space-borne uh, space solutions do you bring to the table? Yeah. So we have already heard that, that Copernicus uh, has a lot to say on climate change, uh, indeed providing a, a, a close monitoring of the planet Earth's uh, health uh, by means of a very accurate uh, picture. Similarly, what we call European Genesis, Galileo and EGNOS, uh, uh, is capable to provide a very accurate uh, positioning uh, over, over the world and is mostly, not only, but mostly addressing uh, transport, all the different uh, kind of transport, which today are mostly using traditional fuel, so having an efficient transport means uh, reduction of CO2 emission. But I would like to answer to this question specifically uh, expanding a little bit on the synergy mm -hmm. between these uh, two systems. Because indeed uh, uh, we are just at the eve uh, of uh, a very interesting and promising development in this respect. Uh, let me quote a couple of examples. Uh, the first one uh, is the so-called smart uh, agriculture. Today, smart agriculture means uh, mostly uh, tractor guidance, uh, mostly automatic steering of the tractors on the field. Um, and I'd like here to quote specifically that already today, 90% of the automatic tractors sold in Europe are EGNOS powered. So this is an important figure give uh, a good feeling of uh, where we are. Tomorrow, smart far farming means uh, um, what we call agriculture 4.0 with the insertion of uh, uh, 5G, of a high volume of data. The farmer will be able to use this uh, smart farming having access uh, of, uh, uh, on the history of the field uh, and here, the so-called um, variable rate application mm -hmm. will come uh, as the solution. So the motto here is to do more with less. And uh, the, the promise here is indeed saving for what concern pesticide, fertilizer, so a very concrete, tangible, uh, result in, for, in terms of climate change. And one last uh, uh, example is uh, um, maritime navigation. So the future of maritime navigation is again automatic uh, maritime uh, guidance 
And here, the two systems are proving to be uh, very well coupled because uh, maritime navigation goes well with uh, very close information on the situation of the sea, meteorological data. And uh, so I conclude by saying that uh, the invitation to the developers, uh, to the entrepreneur, is really to look at this very fertile convergence of the two systems for what concerns climate change. Thank you. Well, next, uh, Florence, you are an expert in uh, weather modeling and uh, providing services for the global society, but especially to Europe. How do you see this? Uh, uh, solutions, what you can bring to the table? Well, in terms of Europe being a global leader, mm. I think in weather forecasting we're already quite a global leader. And what makes our strength is that we know how to combine satellite data with in-situ data and with modeling. And we've been doing that for years. Mm. And so this expertise and this leadership, we actually bring it to the climate now, to the climate arena, because we use the same sort of techniques so we can build from all the expertise that has been developed uh, inside Europe there. And I think that is very strong. So through the same tools, we can go back in time and the, you know, document the, the past climate, see what the climate is now and document the climate and then see the climate for the future. So this expertise we've developed in Europe and how we work together is making us very strong to continue in our leadership based on the leadership on satellite, but also on weather forecasting, I think this is an excellent combination to go forward and being a, a, a leader as well for climate solutions. Mm. Thank you. So next I go, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I already uh, uh, mentioned, but uh, you, you bring us, I guess, uh, fresh results as well, Jan, but uh, then again, you are, uh, uh, sorry, I, did you, did you, yes. yeah. Sorry, um, I bring you also Jean -Yves, Jean -Yves, fresh sorry, results, yeah. but, but let's go. Let's go to your. Uh, to, let's go to your um, uh, area, especially. And how could you describe the established base climate observatory, for example? And how, what kind of solutions you bring to the table from okay. your sector? Uh, sorry. Thank, thank you. So, uh, to ask about uh, your question, I think that uh, if Europe wants uh, to strengthen itself as a global leader in uh, tackling climate change, uh, we need uh, first a political will. It's very important, and I will come back on that. And second, excellent programs. And uh, we have a tradition in Earth observation in Europe. I want to remind that CNES uh, started to uh, propose uh, images uh, coming from space in uh, the mid-80s. And since then, we developed uh, real expertise in Europe with Copernicus, of course, with uh, some satellites of the European Space Agency. And today, I think that uh, we can say that Europe has the best tools to observe climate change from space in the world. And it's a very big achievement because uh, sometimes when you speak about space, people speak about the US, about China, about other countries, but Europe is the leader in uh, Earth observation with satellites and uh, with the decisions which uh, we took uh, last week in Seville, uh, and I'm sure that Jan will elaborate on that, we will continue to be the leader. And so we have excellent programs. But we need also a political will, and uh, from this point of view, in France, we are uh, fortunate with uh, President Emmanuel Macron because uh, you remember that uh, when uh, he has been elected, it uh, happened in the same time when uh, a big country decided to exit the Paris Agreement on climate, and he decided, I quote him, to make our planet great again in implementing uh, the One Planet Summit, and uh, as you mentioned, the Space Climate Observatory is a part of this One Planet Summit. What is the Space Climate Observatory? It's very simple. We want to have all the data coming from all the satellites worldwide, which will be available to everyone in order to mitigate, as it has been proposed, data coming from space and data which are taken in situ. And uh, during the last Paris Air Show in uh, June, we signed the uh, founder agreement of this uh, Space Climate Observatory with almost 30 space agencies. We, since then, we had already uh, another meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. during uh, the International Astronomical Congress. And our objective is to implement this uh, Space Climate Observatory during uh, the, last, the next year. So you see in a nutshell that on one side, we have a very strong 
political will to tackle climate change. On the other side, we have the best space programs in the world. And as a result, I think that we can say that Europe is first in the world to tackle climate change. Thank you. Looks as if that I have tried to very hastily go to you, Jan, but uh, I understand that you still have the fresh results from, uh, from Spain and also uh, you can uh, perhaps now elaborate the, uh, the role of the European Space Agency here and the solutions. Yeah, I, I don't want to go just directly <laughs> to European Space Agency. I would like to go first of all to how to tackle the climate change and then I would like to go to Thank you. Uh, what we do also concretely. So for me it's very important that we should not only look to observation. Observation is nice, is important, blah, 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 everything. But we should also go to action, to mitigation. It's not enough just to say, yes, climate change is there, we see it, the glaciers are melting, the seawater sea uh, uh, the level is raising, and so on. We should also do something against it. So for me, there are really four dimensions of this activity. So number one is observation from the discovery of an effect. This is the most important and most difficult one, to discover an effect. If you have it, you can measure it. But if you don't know about it, really to find it. And the, the greenhouse effect was not discovered on Earth. It was discovered through a, a space mission on Venus. So this was by accident, so to say. Also, the ozone hole was, um, was not at the beginning found out. It was after long of uh, investigations that somebody said, oh, we might have an issue over there. So therefore, the discovery is for me very important. The next one is an observation, and the next one is, of course, the monitoring for a long period to show what is there. But there is another aspect which uh, can observation do. This is raising awareness. And this is not only by very specialized Earth observation instrument, but sometimes it's just by the eyes of people. If we have astronauts coming back from space station and telling us how thin the atmosphere is, how fragile the Earth is, and if they really give their feelings in a picture of the Earth, it makes a total difference, to my opinion. So therefore, this part, this is dimension number one, observation, raising awareness. Um, dimension number two is to develop technologies which help to tackle climate change, and there are a lot space can deliver. For instance, the solar panels. We are right now discussing about solar panels with an efficiency of more than 30%. And there was no need of having solar panels on Earth at the beginning. It was just for space. Now we are traveling towards uh, Mercury, and the solar panels and on board of this uh, spacecraft are really highly efficient, and um, that's, that's a very good thing. Fuel cells. We are now using fuel cells in home uh, heating. And the fuel cells in Apollo 11, they had a fuel cell on board. So this means also fuel cells were, were developed also for and in space. We are discussing about future telecommunication and secure telecommunication needs quantum key distribution. So something, some technology which is now developed also for and in space. And navigation was already mentioned. But there's another thing. Um, if you as a normal European citizen, you are using something like 100 liter water per day, fresh, water. This is really something we should change. And on the International Space Station, they use five liters per day. Uh, that means the coffee of today was the coffee of yesterday. So therefore, what is really possible with space technology, we can really make our life better over here. But space is also, this is third dimension, is an infrastructure. It was mentioned with telecommunication, we can reduce our meetings. I mean, I still like that we are here, but we could do it also by video conferencing. We could do it if this, uh, the system becomes even better. In navigation, um, Carlo mentioned it uh, for logistics. It also that in the future we'll have, we will not have only in our navigation systems in the cars the fastest route or the shortest route, but also the greenest route. And this is not only for cars, but also for airplanes, because uh, the contrails, if you go to the right level of planes, you can reduce the contrails dramatically. And we know that the contrails are something, now I look to you, Florence, something of 5% of the global clouds are coming from contrails. So uh, I'm not discussing about the effect, only the, the number, the, the size of clouds. So therefore, and precision farming was mentioned. So this is the third dimension. The fourth dimension is, as institutions, who are working in space, we should also do something. We should not wait until others are doing something. And therefore, by using all of these instruments, we can reduce dramatically the meetings. 
we can do less travels, we can do, of course, also things um, in uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, business. And for instance, business cards are not any longer necessary. If you use uh, space technology and news technology, very simple, so you have your QR, QR code and then you don't need uh, business cards. And I'm, I'm eager to calculate how much paper is used just for business cards. I'm sure it is an amount we are shocked if we know about it. And of, of course, we can also, as uh, organizations, do less um, waste. Now, all of this is general terms. Now we have the Space 19 Plus, the ministerial conference in Seville, and this was covering all of these different aspects. At the end, we got something like 4.2 billion euros per year, or overall 14.4 billion. Earth observation was oversubscribed. Oversubscribed, that means the member states paid more money than we asked them for, including also Arctic, a special program for the Arctic weather. The technology program, which looks to these new technologies, was heavily oversubscribed. The telecommunication got more money than last time. The digital ESA is something which I propose to be not only for the sake of digitalization, but for being digital ESA equal. Green ESA was confirmed by the member states. And finally, we are talking about space always as being there and being used, but you have to, have to secure it also, and therefore, to secure the infrastructure space, we have a space safety program, which is not only looking, like was mentioned earlier, with SSA and tracking, but also to remove debris, to avoid debris directly, and also to have collision avoidance systems. So I think this uh, program shows that uh, from the uh, ministerial that now all the member states in Europe including the ones of ESA and the EU, that they are aware that we can do something, and if we do it together, then the word of Etienne Schneider, the uh, Vice Prime Minister of Luxembourg, becomes true, united space in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And next, ladies and gentlemen, I have Thomas. I, I excuse, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry for the bad introduction, but uh, Thomas is the... Um, founder of the Children for the Oceans, uh, that's a non-governmental organization, and we are very proud to have you here. So my question to you is, of course, uh, how do you see from your perspective the, uh, what, what has been already said here, but also uh, how do you see the, uh, the role of space-born things in your work and in your uh, goals? Well, I think, first of all, the first step of fighting against climate change is through education and awareness. because. Mm -hmm. All this data that we have, we need to be able to put it in school programs so that children, they use it, so that they use it, they see real scientific data and they understand the threat. So I have an NGO called Children for the Ocean and basically the objective is to raise children's awareness on the necessity to protect our ocean. And in these awareness sessions, I use, uh, I use data, I use real, uh, data provided by Copernicus Marine Service and this data it enables me to show children and they understand how in our ocean everything is connected and how we all have an impact and I think yeah the first step of fighting climate change is education and yeah like I said earlier like all this data that we have we need to implement in school programs and so that through awareness sessions children like the whole civil society, the whole civil society is targeted through such awareness sessions because the children they are the pillar for the dissemination of the information that they hear to their parents, their friends, and so if we start by education, the whole civil society will be more aware. So, yeah. thank you. One thing that was uh, mentioned here uh, quite often, and it's, it has to do with the, uh, uh, the sustained uh, say, uh, source for the data, the monitoring itself, uh, is, uh, of course, of primary importance for all of us that we sustain this monitoring. But carbon dioxide is a new one. How do you feel, uh, how do we sustain uh, now 
the, the very new thing, the space-borne carbon uh, monitoring in the future, so that we can actually really see the whole picture of the globe and where the carbon is coming and where it's going to, and, and how it can be, uh, this information be used for the political decision making, but also in order to, for, for example, for businesses to understand better their global footprint of, 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 of carbon and maybe even the hand, handprint. So who would like to start with this for us, please? I think Pierre Delso already mentioned that there is this new initiative in the new phase of Copernicus to have a constellation of satellites measuring carbon. Mm. We already have a few actually, but they are not as accurate as we need them mm. to be. And we also have a few in situ observations measuring it, but again, it only gives a partial solution. So it's very complicated carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere because not only it's what we produce, but it's also a natural cycle of carbon. And it's really not just the atmosphere, it's the land, it's the ocean, it's everything. So what you measure from space is usually concentrations, but these actually depend on the sources, on the sinks, and on the meteorology that transports the CO2. So if you really want to go from the CO2 concentrations to the emissions, which is what we actually do to the carbon, then it's much more complicated than just observing the concentration with a low accuracy. So you need everything. You need the satellites, but you need all the modeling of the Earth system so that you can get also the natural cycle of the carbon and then pinpoint the emissions to a good accuracy. And I think we already start developing the science, and I think it's only Europe having this ambition of having this sort of observatory infrastructure where you combine everything and where you can go to a monitoring system of man-made emissions of CO2. But again, we need everything. We need the satellites for sure. We will benefit from these uh, new sentinels. But we need also all the infrastructure and the whole science around this is very important. Yes, please. No, uh, uh, Florence has explained everything, so I don't need to read it much better than I could have done it. Uh, but I would like to follow what Jan said and also uh, the re representative of the real life. It's clear that what we, the information we can provide are only information. They give us a signal, but what really matters is that we do something about the causes of the, uh, creating this signal. And from that point of view, as you know, we have now a new commission, and one of the first documents which will be adopted very soon by the commission is what we call the Green Deal. So, which is basically a long list of measures and actions which needs to be taken. Because again, let's be realistic also. If you want to have a greener industry, it's not something you can do in two years' time, in five years' time. It takes 20 years' time to have a much greener industry. It takes a long time to change the way, you know, products are being manufactured and so on. So, the message is, Earth observation space would be important to give us a signal, but of course we need to take concrete measures to do it. And that's what we want to do with the Green Deal. That's one aspect. The second aspect, and making the link also with what was said before, we will give pictures, but one of the problems with Copernicus, for instance, is the fact that we have a lot of data, and those data are not exploited. So we should also develop artificial intelligence. And I know ESA is working on it, but not only ESA. We should use actually develop artificial intelligence to be able to dig those data and to find information, to find elements that we are not necessarily able to find now. And so, because a lot of data information is there, simply we, don't, we are not able to analyze them in an appropriate manner. So again, let's try to see what we can do with artificial intelligence. And again, it's being done. But we should deep, deepen this to make sure that we use more artificial, artificial intelligence to be able to find interesting elements out of those data. Thank you. Shani, you wish to take the floor? Yes. Yes, it's working. Yes, o on the satellites which are uh, devoted to observe the emissions of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, methane, there are already some satellites existing. Uh, on the CNES side, we are developing now a microcarb which will be launched uh, within two years for carbon dioxide and the Merlin for methane in close connection with DLR, which will be launched a little bit later. But I think that uh, it's probably the next step because uh, today 
days are not so many uh, such satellites uh, worldwide. There are satellites in uh, China, Tansat, uh, in, uh, in the US with uh, OCO, in uh, Japan, GOSAT. And uh, the next step is uh, beyond the data, what to do with this data? Because uh, if we know that there are some uh, sources, some sinks of carbon dioxide and methane, okay, it's a good information, but uh, what is very important is the next step, and I do fully agree with Pierre, because artificial intelligence will be key to use this data and uh, to implement them in all what is done in the actions which are done to uh, tackle climate change. Jan, I noticed yes, that you I, took I the would like to well. add uh, <laughs> another point of that. Um, I think it's very important, especially with carbon dioxide, uh, to know where the source is. Uh, you not, just not want to know that there is a, a mean value over whole Europe or whatever. You, you want to know where the, where the, the uh, source is of this uh, carbon si the, um, dioxide emission. And for that, unfortunately, I say, because normally I'm not arguing very much in favor of that, we need a fleet. You cannot do it with one satellite, you cannot do it with two satellites, um, and that means for me also, whenever we are talking about fleets, we at the same time have to be, uh, to have to secure that we are not polluting the space. So that means uh, debris removal, debris avoidance is then also an aspect. But again, for me, important is we need more satellites, especially for these looking to where does the CO2 comes from, and then we need also to have a better monitoring system of where does it go. We have some things, but uh, we launched last year Aeolus, a satellite which is measuring wind speed from space for the first time with uh, UV technology, UV laser technology. And again, it's only one satellite. So I think there must be some more operational things in this direction. And also a big exchange worldwide. We should not be in competition in observing carbon dioxide worldwide but we should do it in cooperation. So whatever the other countries are, as I've mentioned uh, several, we should exchange the data because only then we can have a better global and regional picture. Yes, thank you. Well, Thomas was uh, emphasizing especially the, uh, the oceans. And of course, the oceans, we know that there is a problem of, of that we put too much trash into the ocean, but we also put a lot of CO2 into the ocean, which is invisible to us. Are we good enough? We have a lot of innov innovation here, but are we good enough in that? I, perhaps, Jan, are you in a position to uh, elaborate this a bit more? So we, we, we have, uh, there's an interesting question, for instance, also, the, you may, did not mention that one, but the, uh, the plastic waste in mm. the seas. So we ask young people to come up with some new disruptive idea how to, to, to measure that one. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that we can also go with this. But it's difficult from my point of view to observe how CO2 is uh, eaten up by the seas. Mm. Uh, but uh, I take this question back and I will give it to this group and I'm sure they come back. Why, why I'm so sure? I give you another example. I said for urban noise, I would like to, to have a measurement from space. And all the experts says, no problem, no, no chance, no, no solution, nothing. We gave it to this group, <laughs> they came up. Uh, young people are so creative um, and we should never say uh, we did not do it like that in the past so we don't do it in the future, otherwise we should go back to cave painting. So therefore we should give them an opportunity and the young people, you mentioned it, with education, if they are through education are curious to do something, so it's not only to be aware but also to be <coughs> curious, there are always some solutions we never thought about. So I take this point back. And maybe next year, if you invite me again, I can give you a first idea. Thank you. Thomas, how does it sound like? <laughs> I think also what's really important to point out is that like, when, I, when I deliver an awareness session, there's too many children that ignore like, what, the oceans does, what the ocean does for the Earth, for, for instance, so it absorbs CO2 emissions. And the more the, more the children... The more the children uh, <coughs> Uh, how can I put this? The more they know about our ocean, the more they want to protect it. And today, there's not enough, uh, people don't know enough about the ocean. They just see this blue pack of water, but they don't know that, for instance, whales absorb CO2. Like, there's this whole kind of ecosystem. And I think that's the most important. If, if like, they know the ocean is in danger, and, they, that, and that this danger is created from their daily lives, like 
if, if they know they have an impact in their daily life, for instance, taking the car or taking the bus, examples like that, if they know that species are suffering, the ocean is suffering from uh, the things they do in their daily life, they're definitely going to try to stop it because it's their future, it's our future, and they're the one that are really, they're really, they really want to improve the situation, but they just don't know. For instance, wh when they buy, I don't know, when, when they buy, uh, <laughs> uh, for instance, I don't know, if, if for instance, the, uh, their parents are organizing a party, and instead of buying, and, and they only buy, and they only buy single-use plastic, well, they know it's going to have an impact on the ocean, because it's going to increase waste, this plastic might end up on the ocean, and the production of plastic uh, emits CO2 emissions. And if they know that uh, organizing this party using single-use plastic is going to have an effect on the ocean and its ecosystem, and basically ho the whole nature, they're going to want to improve it, that. And by communicating to their parents, like I said earlier, the whole civil society is targeted. So, yeah. Thank you. So if I, if I uh, understand what you call for is that you call for... Uh, that everybody should show that they are real with their actions. So perhaps for the panelists, how do we show that we are investing a lot of uh, uh, our resources, common resources into space? What, how, how would you, in a very simple terms, so what is the space doing for us and the investments that we can show that we are doing? I hope that you took my meaning. Yes, please. Maybe <laughs> I, can, I can start because yes. indeed your question is, uh, uh, touching really the core of uh, the GSA activity, which mm. is uh, to develop uh, application and services. Mm. This is really our, our focus. Well, uh, maybe a word here to say that if we speak about the GNSS, uh, the big part of the value is on application and services. Mm. So on something concrete, which is not uh, only, only on space. Uh, we at the GSA have been uh, funding uh, over the years uh, through the Horizon 2020 projects around 100 concrete projects, uh, finding concrete solution to specific uh, question. Um, and more recently, we've been using other instruments like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, hackathons, uh, uh, addressing uh, young engineers, entrepreneurs. Maybe some concrete example can uh, well answer to, to your question. And here, I tell you right away that uh, the only limit is the creativity. So some example uh, on uh, uh, the GNSS and uh, the climate uh, uh, change. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, recently we funded a project uh, which is uh, guiding drones uh, for the maintenance of uh, solar cell fields. This is one example. Another example is um, Galileo and Egnos uh, uh, driving robots within a greenhouse uh, in order to reduce and optimize pesticides, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or, very, very interesting as well, uh, recently, uh, a very um, interesting uh, app uh, which is creating uh, a, a virtual uh, circle of users using parking. So if you enter in this uh, uh, virtual community, you communicate when, uh, uh, to others who are interested to park. You are communicating, you are freeing a place, and another who is interested will be uh, reaching this free space uh, easily. So only to say that uh, indeed the effort uh, has to be to link space technology to concrete answer in our daily life. Thank you. Florence, yes. <laughs> okay, then Jan. But okay, Florence so first. what I would like to say, we need a climate change, but a different climate change. A climate change, as you mentioned, uh, in the society. And uh, I can tell you it was not so easy for me when I announced for the Space 19 Plus for the Ministerial as a title, Inspiration, Competitiveness, and responsibility. Inspiration, everybody was happy, but did not know what I mean behind that, especially also the, the motivation of people to, to make a better world. That was a part of that one. 
uh, the competitiveness is uh, rather easy, but also, again, industry to work on, on this climate change aspect. But responsibility, it's still difficult to sell responsibility, I can tell you. In, in climate change now with observation, it's, it's accepted. But in other areas, it's still not so easy. So I, I think age, uh, entities and heads of entities should really try to work also on the, on the climate change in this direction of changing the climate. And of course, you are doing this, but I think I'm now especially talking to people like me who were a little bit resistant and reluctant in the past to do it. I think we have a responsibility and we, we should take it. Um, and therefore, the, also it's not our future, but it's your future. Uh, but therefore, I think we all can do something and work for responsibility is uh, noble work. Thank you. <laughs> Florence. Yes, so in the Copernicus Climate Change Service, we, of course, publish the state of the climate. I mean, we, I say we, sorry. Yeah. The CMWF is operating on behalf of the EU, the Copernicus uh, change, uh, sure. Climate Change Service. Sure. So there is all this information there, but it's true that it's through targeted services that actually you reach the end citizen and the end user. And for instance, I'm going to talk about an application we have with you guys at the Finnish Met Institute. So based on our products, you are uh, developing an app that actually helps for forest harvesting in the Nordic countries. And I think that's very useful because people know that based on the climate information, they can optimize the harvesting of trees. So they, have these, they, they, they are aware of climate and the current climate. But in terms of climate change, we also have an app, uh, an application, a service with the olive tree growers in Tuscany. And this is about climate changes as well, the prevalence of pests. And there is this uh, olive uh, fruit uh, fly that is actually going to be more prevalent when right. climate changes. Right. So not only people uh, can adapt their farming, but they also then, so it's adaptation, but it's also mitigation in the sense that then they are aware of because of climate change, their business is going to change. So then they are even more keen to understand the message that we need to do something for the climate. And these are just a couple of applications, but the more we have these applications based on all our space data and all the services, the more we reach a wide range of people and users. Have we taken enough into account uh, the, what Thomas said about their needs and his uh, uh, friends' needs when they are gathering together how to provide actually them a similar information as we're doing for the farming, as you explained? Have we taken this into account enough? Yes, no? <laughs> I'm ashamed to say we still had plastic bottles when we had meetings at ECMWF and I'm yeah. <laughs> trying to get rid of them. Yeah. But we yes, it's true, better. it has to, we have to show the example as well and yeah. be aware ourselves, not only show uh, the good yeah. word to the people, but actually also travel yes. less and travel economy and these sort of mm. things so that we don't spend uh, so much carbon footprint exactly. in our own organization. We, it has to start with giving an example as well. Jean, if I noticed that you took a mic as well, or, or Thomas, maybe you would like to reply. Uh. Yeah. Did you, um, do you think that we could have a, a kind of a better solutions uh, in terms of, for example, applications that take into account the, uh, the weather, for example, when you are um, making the best possible and economic, ecologically sustainable choices in your uh, daily life? <coughs> well, I think everything should be made accessible to mm -hmm. everyone, to the whole civil society, and understandable, because there's too much data that, well, because I'm definitely not an expert, and yeah. there's too much data that is really, to be honest, hard to understand. Exactly. And I think we need to like e only extract the maybe the main idea of this mm -hmm. data. And I, to be honest, I really think that, like I said earlier, it's all uh, the first step. It's all about education. And for instance, today we learn history, we learn mathematics, and and there should be definitely a strong uh, like. Uh, lessons about climate change because the more we know the more we want to protect and yeah that, that's my message mm. thank you
Jean, if I noticed that you took a mic, so uh, would you like to... Um no, but uh, I think that uh, responsibility and uh, having uh, climate change present in mind whatever we do is uh, very, very important. And uh, this is why uh, we work in parallel of uh, the satellites which are devoted to observe climate change. We work also on satellites which are more, uh, let us say, uh, friendly, environment friendly, because in the past, uh, Everybody knows that when we launch rockets, we de develop satellites, it made a lot of pollution, and there is a big effort which is made also on this side because uh, it would be uh, some uh, kind of contradiction uh, to uh, launch satellites to uh, tackle climate change and to pollute when launching them. Mm. Thank you. So now I'm turning to the uh, audience. If um, anybody would have a question to our panelists, uh, uh, this is an exceptional opportunity for all of us. Do I see any uh, hands there? Yeah. There we have one. Please wait for the microphone. Go ahead. Yes. Hello, uh, Pascal and Zenz. Uh, can you hear me? Because, uh, yes. Yes? Okay, good. Pascal and Zenz from Agence Europe. Uh, I was wondering what is your understanding why member states want to reduce budget for space program for the European Union while they increase the budget for the European Space Agency. What is the message? Because as we know, the European Space Agency is an intergovernmental uh, organization. Thank you. Okay, yeah. This to you, I guess? <laughs> I'm not sure it's to me because the Commission proposal is very clear. First of all, it's not a question of competition between ESA and the EU. So the more money ESA gets, the better it is for everybody. So it's not, uh, certainly, I'm not, uh, I'm very pleased, and I say it openly and frankly, I'm very pleased by the su success of the ministerial uh, in uh, Sevilla, of ESA ministerial. It's extremely important. So from that point of view, it's certainly something which is very good. Now, as you know, from a commission point of view, like you say, we believe that we need also to be ambitious. And uh, we need to put, you know, more money on the table. Because again, if you look at what's happening in the rest of the world, in the US, in China, in India, in Japan, everywhere, they're all investing in space. Why should we not do the same thing? And it's public money and private money. So we should be competitive. You know, I'm not going to, you know, we, ha we have a friendly relationship with ESA. So Jan is quoting a study, that, a survey that he has made, asking the Europeans, you know, how much money do you believe we should spend in space? You want to spend. They want, you want to spend in space. And the figure is 287 euros per person. Per, so per, person per, year. per year. So multiply this by 500 million people, and you will see what Europeans are willing to pay for space. We are far from it, even if you combine EU budget and ESA budget. So, to come back to your question, yes, we believe we need to do it. We believe we need to be ambitious. And let's not also forget one thing, that one euro which is invested in space brings more euro on us. Because you have indirect benefits which are there for everybody. So, yes, let's hope that finally, finally, Member States will follow the will follow the Commission proposal, even be more ambitious, and we count on the Parliament also to help us in this context. But if I'm allowed to, so, yes, yeah, for yeah. instance, it's not that black and white as it looks like. So for instance, also Copernicus is a program where ESA and the EU is working together. And they spent additional money for Copernicus also in ESA. They increased it above our proposal by 400 million. So I think there is an understanding of the member states for all of these aspects, and I would not put it in, in any competition between uh, EU, EC, and ESA. We are jointly working together in this area, in Copernicus, in Galileo, and, and we will do it also in the other fields. So for me, this is not a, a vanity fair or whatever. Okay, thank you. Johnny. 
But uh, from this point of view, I should say that, um, as a matter of fact, the Ministerial of Civil has been completely different from the previous ones. Uh, because of my white hair, uh, I started the Ministerial since 1985. A lot of you were not born at this time. But uh, for the first time, in my opinion, we had a Ministerial who was citizen-friendly because the two big programs where uh, the member states decided to put much more money than what it was expected are earth observation, but it is directly related to climate and uh, climate change. And the second is exploration and the science, which is related to dream. And these are exactly the two topics when you speak about space to uh, citizens, they speak uh, about climate change and they speak about exploration. And this is exactly, and probably for the first time in the history of the ministerial, this is exactly what the member states decided to do. And I think that this is an excellent news because perhaps for the first time, we will be programs which are dictated by the citizens. And this is exactly what we want. Thank you. So do I see any uh, other questions from the audience? I see one hand here and one there. So we take two, these two and then we, uh, start the closing of the session, but please go ahead. Hi, my name is Pablo Ruiz from uh, Deep Blue Globe. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Mr. D Dr. Jan Werner for the excellent outcome of the ministerial. But uh, I do have a question regarding the, um, the future plan. So today we are hearing a lot of the importance of our oceans uh, for climate change, for example. But uh, in the next uh, Copernicus high priority missions, none of them is uh, studying the ocean. We also have representative of Keness, which is France is the leading country in, alt in altimetry by far. And uh, we have Sentinel-3, we have Sentinel-6 to be launched uh, next year. But there is no proposal for the next decade uh, to, to study further the oceans. There was a Earth Explorer mission proposed, which was a scheme, which unfortunately was not uh, okay. At the end, it was a decision, one or the other, so it did not succeed. So, there is any plan, either from ESA or from the Commission, to, to invest more in the ocean? Thank you. Okay, let's take the second question as well, and then we uh, go together with them. So, please, uh, state okay. your, you, you, your mic is yours. Axel Renneke from Ruach Space. Um, my question is, what will the EU, EU and also ESA do to convince the European citizens that infrastructure like investments in space are the same as for roads, for electricity, for railroad. And this is not something that queer scientists have figured out and it's something exotic, but it's something we need to have in order to become uh, competitive in the next century. Thank you. So taking into account the both yeah. questions, Jan, you are so I, uh, I can answer to both to of start. them. So <laughs> number one concerning the oceans, uh, you're right. We should do more, but we cannot do all at the same time. So as you mentioned correctly, we were proposing also an uh, explorer mission. Explorer missions are the missions of ESA itself, so not part of the Copernicus program. Uh, we proposed something over there, but it was a competition between two, and so at this time it was another mission which was winning. But it doesn't mean that this, these activities are stopped. It does not mean like that, not at all. We are going ahead and uh, we will propose also something in that direction and I think it's important. The other question concerning infrastructure, I can tell you a story. When I started the preparation of the ministerial to discuss it with all the member states, uh, 22 member states, and I wanted to get support, so I was thinking about how I can introduce what I intend to do. You heard about what I said earlier, inspiration, competitiveness and responsibility, and I have, can tell you this came only during the discussion that I used it. At the beginning I said, infrastructure, space is an infrastructure. And I got very harsh criticism from some member states saying, infrastructure, this is boring. You cannot uh, con uh, convince people with a word of infrastructure. Then we discussed and we changed it to space is infrastructure and enabler. And suddenly, just these additional words makes a difference. And this is true. Space is an enabler. But space is an infrastructure. And your question, how to uh, convince people? People are more convinced than we sometimes believe. They are more convinced. We heard about, uh, Pierre was saying about the money. We made a big uh, survey uh, over Europe. 
it was for me really a surprise how clear, clearly the, the words from the citizens came, what should be done, what is space today, so they are better informed than sometimes people believe. But you're right, we have to do more, and the only way I see is to use all these channels of, uh, channels of social media, mm. events like this, going to schools, what I do reg regularly, going to universities, and to talk about it. Uh, if you have a better idea, I mean, Ruach is an excellent company, maybe you have a better idea, uh, but this is uh, more the traditional way, which I'm saying. But if each and every one of you goes now out of this room and tells it to 10 people, who then tell it to 10 people, to 10 people, we are, in some days, we are around the world, no problem. Thank you. Um, Madam President, please. Yeah. There is one. Thank you. This is for Thomas. Why not also the others? So um, I, I agree with what was recently said that uh, politicians don't believe that they, they voters, or not all, but a uh, very big part of voters, uh, they, they really uh, listen and understand. So uh, one way to convince the politicians is that they, they hear it. Uh, have you had in your network, in your, in your uh, working, have you had a contacts? With, uh, with the politicians in your own country, so in, in uh, uh, regional law, so that uh, what you think about the oceans which, uh, and the blue economy and all that, and the role of the oceans in the climate change. Have you met politicians? Wait, so I didn't get the question uh, asked. Did you meet politicians? Did you meet politicians? No. Uh, no, you uh, should. I'm my encouragement. <laughs> so, so. They, they, they will listen to you. They will listen to you. Well, I think also if it's uh, like youth, like uh, children that are like, for instance, the, the movement Friday for Future, if I think we have more credibility kind of because it's our future really. So if, if we're the ones, uh, if we're the ones, uh, going on climate strike, for instance, or talking to politicians about, about how we want things to change, I think they should listen more, and because, yeah, it's our future, so, but I, no, Yes. Hmm. Yeah, go on. But like, yeah. uh, I don't know what's, uh, Well, I give you a little time to think, but perhaps we give an awful lot for that. Um, I disagree a little bit with you. I'm the father of three children, and I can tell you my responsibility is at least as big as the ones of the kids because I think about their future, you understand? So therefore, I think you can get politicians, you can get all, also the old gray-haired people. Uh, if by tackling and by putting to them the question, do you think about the future of your children or grandchildren? So, you see, this is also something where responsibility is directly uh, possible. And also to add up, I think, again, all of this is linked to knowledge because there's still some people that ignore the fact that uh, when, when they buy very cheap stuff, it's all, all surrounded by plastic, they ignore, some, most of the people today ignore the impact it has on our planet. And if everybody knows it, if everyone on earth knows the impact of taking the plane or so something like that, well, it, the whole community will change and the, uh, the minds will change. So I think that's the first step. Thank you. That's very good advice for all of us. Thank you. Um, let me start a final round with all our panelists and I'd like to catalyze my, um, my final round with you uh, with a question that I actually draw also from Madam President's uh, opening speech that there is an urgency what we're doing and uh, there is no magic to take everything carbon neutral or whatever in 2050, 2040, 2030, you name the year unless there is a way there. So I guess that during the next five years, there has to be results that we can show, and we can show especially to Thomas and, and his friends. So uh, my question for your final round, and you ca you're also free to make your uh, own comments uh, about uh, other matters, but is that uh, where are we? What have we achieved during the next five years? 
Pierre, would you be <laughs> so kind and uh, start? Thank you. No, I, I already mentioned to you the. I already already mentioned to you the fact that the Commission is coming to a document, very important document, which is uh, called the Green Deal, which will be adopted very quickly by the new Commission, and which basically will be a very ambitious document, listing a number of actions that we need to take and to, to make sure that we implement, all of us implement. But again, one thing which is clear, there is no simple solution. You know, for instance, saying that industry must become more green will take time. But what will be also the social impact on some kind of technologies and people working in those technologies? We need to address this also if we don't want to have a negative reaction. And again, not everything is so simple. Florence, you mentioned the fact of banning plastic bottles. But plastic bottles can be recycled and could be fully, fully reutilized, reused. If you have glass bottle and you have someone bringing those glass bottles somewhere to clean them and to, re uh, to reuse them afterwards, what is impact on the environment? What is worse? So my point is, it's really a complex issue, but we need to work all of us together. We need to be ambitious, but we need to address all aspects of the question. And in this context, space is an important element just to give us figures, to give us facts, to explain things. And oceans are important, one, one point or so that to react. You know, you seem to consider that because we have no, no new mission, we forget those existing. But we, we, we have already something on ocean, and of course we will continue to do, to do it and to use it. We simply don't have any new mission because we cannot create any new mission, you know, we don't have an, an unlimited budget. But so to come back to my, what I was saying, environment is a very important issue. We need to be aware of its consequences. But let's be very clear, it will not be easy, and all of us will have to make efforts and to address it from a holistic point of view. Thank you. Carlo, so, yeah, you, you so next. The, the Galileo and EGNOS uh, perspective in this respect. Well, if we look uh, to the last uh, four years, since the time when uh, uh, Galileo has been announced uh, open uh, to, to the service, well, the results are really remarkable. Uh, now, looking ahead, uh, uh, the next uh, three, four years, well, Galileo and EGNOS have to build uh, on uh, improving the performances. What is ahead uh, is uh, better accuracy, uh, authentication of the signal, and uh, these improved performances, uh, which will be really peculiar to the European Genesis, uh, will boost new application, new services. Maybe one example above all is the automated car. The features I was telling you uh, are really uh, at the base uh, of the automated car of the future. Today we are working with all the major European car manufacturers to deliver in this time frame, three, four years, uh, the automated car which will finally represent uh, will produce the best efficient use of the, of the resources. Thank you. Florence. Okay, so I will talk about renewable energies and what the Copernicus services in particular can bring to renewable energies. I think it has really stimulated the growth of the sector because with the information we provide on the climate, uh, we, we provide information on solar radiation on wind, on hydropower, all these helps renewable energy. So I think we can really contribute uh, as Europeans and with these Copernicus services to boost the renewable energies. And there is so much innovation in that field, I don't know where they will get to in the next few years. But I also take the point of Pierre Delsou when he says artificial intelligence and the beauty of open and free data and providing them in an infrastructure, again, you know, uh, where you, people can build AI applications and all sorts of applications to see what they get out of it. The innovation that can be brought by providing a, the right infrastructure and the right data, I don't know what the future will bring, but I'm pretty sure it will be great. Yes, thank you, Johnny. 
think that for the next uh, five years, uh, we are going to get the dividends of the decisions which have been taken uh, since uh, the beginning of the Paris Agreement, because it is probably in 2015, almost five years ago, that people realized that satellites can play a real role in tackling climate change. Uh, when I started to say that out of the 50 essential climate variables, uh, 26, which is more than half, can be observed just from space, people were really astonished because they didn't know that. And so following that, we started uh, to develop a number of systems and uh, Copernicus and the huge success we had in Seville uh, with uh, people putting a lot of money in Copernicus is the best demonstration. We are now structuring uh, all this data, all these systems. Uh, we are implementing uh, the Space Climate Observatory, and I am sure that uh, in five years from now, we will have a real system allowing to tackling climate change with space solutions. It will be new because today we speak a lot, but uh, within five years, we will deliver. Thank you. Jan. Yes, so um, I'm the Director General of ESA, the European Space Agency, being a research and development agency and a technical agency. And in this room, most of the people are converted people, converted to space. So you expect most probably from a Director General of uh, ESA then also research and development solutions, but exactly because you are expecting that, I will not follow that. I think the chain is very important, the chain from global observation to raising awareness and then to local mitigation. I think this is the solution of all of it. And there's another thing, we know all that these weather aspects and climate is really complex. It's, it's really complicated. Also, all these calculation models, very complicated, and you can dive into it with artificial intelligence, with quantum computing, with whatever you have. But what is important at the same time is that we have an understandable narrative of what we are doing. So bringing down all these complicated matters, which are there and which are fine, and we have to do it. Some things in this world are complex, and we should not say there is no complexity. So therefore, coming from complex systems, to understandable narratives for the public and not only for the converted one. I hope we can reach this one in the next five years. Thank you. Thomas. Hmm. So exactly like you said, I think there's plenty of many different solutions, but we need to, if we want the civil society to act, we need to promote the ones that are accessible and simple because they're willing to act if the, so the solutions are simple and made accessible to them. So for instance, when I go to schools and I share a list of daily tips that children can apply in their daily life, it's really simple, basic stuff. But I, I sh like, it's, it's not complex because if I want them to respect it in their daily life and apply it, it has to be simple. So I think there's plenty of different solutions. We also need very complex ones, but if we want the civil society to act, it has to be also simple solutions. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to close this uh, panel now. I'd like to thank all our panelists. This has been uh, very exciting for me, and I've so also learned a lot during the past. I hope that you all have too. Uh, I think that in Europe we are uh, very proud of the original things that, we co that come from the uh, Europe, we, we have the AOC brand and uh, we, we have a lot of nice wines and, and cheeses and all those matters and, and, and in order to uh, sort of understand those, you, you don't do it by your brain, you do it by your heart. And I think that this is the fourth stone that I would like to bring to this table and I very much thank you Thomas for bringing this up that we have to start loving our planet and we have to start also doing things in our heart not only in our brains but thank you very much for the very nice panel and I hope you have a fun time too also here in Finland thank you Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a short break, 20 minutes, and we'll be talking about sustainability and a new space ecosystem. See you in 20 minutes. Thank you very much.
welcome back. Hopefully our colleagues will also, will also be joining us shortly. I think they took the advice of President Halonen a little bit too seriously when she said the most important part of these seminars is the coffee break. True indeed, but also the content of what's happening on stage soon is going to be extremely exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, we're continuing our discussion around sustainability with a fascinating keynote and panel on the topic. But before that, I'd like you to watch this video. Can you roll the video, please? Thank you. The video was very helpful. We got at least 50 more people come in during that time. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great uh, pride to introduce one of Finland's rising entrepreneurs in the field of space. Uh, his company is a global leader in small satellite synthetic aperture radar, so SAR for short. This technology has been revolutionary in the area of, of small satellites and his company will be talking to us about the collaboration within, within Finland with top tech universities and the space community at large. Who better to talk to us about creating new space ecosystem for sustainable growth than the wonderful Pekka Raurila from ISI. Welcome, tervetuloa. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, I come from a company called ISI, and uh, in the topic words, new space, sustainable growth, ecosystem, a lot of um, buzzwords. I will give you uh, uh, maybe a bit of an intro, and hopefully the, uh, the, the panel can then digest that further. Um, but first, just a bit about us, you know, what's, what's our credentials in, in talking about this matter at all? So ISI, actually happens to be the biggest satellite operator in Finland and uh, you know starting to be one of the biggest satellite operators in, in Europe too and um, we have become you know the biggest space technology, com space technology company in Finland by number of people uh, already already this year and uh, and we have offices in three other locations too Poland UK and, and US and uh, the core IP, you know, why are we so cool? Uh, so we've designed and built the world's smallest synthetic aperture radar, so imaging radar satellites. Uh, we were the first to launch a below 100 kilogram uh, satellite that does this type of radar imaging. And uh, we've also launched the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth uh, of those world's smallest ones uh, in, in this category. So, so uh, uh, we, are, we are moving quite rapidly forward. And, um, in February next year, we will actually be the biggest SAR satellite operator in the world. And uh, by end of 2020, we will actually be larger by number of satellites than any, like all the, the SAR satellites combined in, in the world. And uh, in some of the earlier, or earlier uh, sessions, year 2025, must mention, you know, if all goes to plan, we will have the access to image any place on the surface of the Earth uh, every hour, talking about centimeter scale resolutions, and detecting movements in millimeter scales. And if this is radar, it's all in 3D too. So, so the vision is quite big in terms of the hardware development side. Uh, and then we are certainly moving quite rapidly and then on, on schedule to do this. Um, and then why are we doing this? Um, it's, um, it's a question like the word infrastructure was mentioned before. Um, so um, what we're trying to do is, is sort of build new digital infrastructure for the world, in a way kind of comparable to GNSS satellite navigation. But here, instead of knowing in real time where the uh, receivers are, uh, we're talking about the system that allows you to know where everything is at all times. And um, just like GNSS, you know, nowadays, not all users of GNSS are 
space industry anymore. You have your Ubers and, and, and so forth. So like, you know, you can imagine just about any business process using uh, GNSS services. And, and this is really very much the aim for us too, that, that, that the service that allows you to see everything in real time is something that will integrate to literally any business process in, in the world. Um, and um, you know, just a few examples, if, if this feels, uh, um, let's say, uh, hard, to, hard to grasp. So, so some of the applications that we're working on right now already are, are, are in, say, microfinance, in agriculture. So these are more like, um, let's say, enabling better quality of life by a sort of uh, objective and real-time measurement that enables trust. Uh, so microfinance in agriculture is a good example where monitoring in real time and verifying planting and harvest times is something that allows companies to finance uh, actors that have traditionally have you know, been in markets where trust doesn't exist and then verification is, is the only way how, how, how this type of uh, new financing markets uh, will come into play. And the same goes for, for insurance side, so making micro insurance products based on parametrics uh, if we're able to provide objective measurement of, of let's say, maximum flood extents uh, with high enough revisit rates so that we can actually capture that maximum flood extent every time, that means that you can create these low overhead micro, uh, micro insurance products based on purely the parametric and, and, and not actually having to have the overhead of, of loss adjustment at all. And this is the good 90% of the world property that is still uninsured that could benefit from a service like this. And, um, so if we're having these massive uh, infrastructure visions, um, why are we a private company? Um, and it's a, it's a fair question specifically in Europe. It's a very traditional thing in Europe that, that infrastructure tends to be public. We're talking about roads and, and bridges and so forth. So um, I think you know, what we would say to that is that you know, currently Google or Amazon you know, have ended up owning practically every bit of of, of this, this section of, of sort of professional uh, digital infrastructure that you use on your everyday work or everyday business. And we actually seem to be quite happy with it. And it seems that it was the only way how it happened. And, uh, and I think this is something that, that, that you know, that the discussion should go forward that, you know, should Europe be able to do better? Should Europe be able to actually own any piece of digital infrastructure uh, in, in this chain? Because right now it's not looking terribly great. Um, so this is a starter, and, um, and then now talking about these ecosystems. So, so ISI very much is a product of an ecosystem already. So, so we are, in a way, standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, and, um, and, and you know, the research and industrial development in uh, you know, Finnish aerospace, Finnish mobile industry, uh, European, European aerospace, uh, European you know, space agency membership, uh, Copernicus program data, all of these are things that have already been built, and that they have been built with public money, and, and, and they certainly have contributed to, to, the, to the, uh, our team getting started. And um, the education, so something that is much closer to, to, to us in terms of history is, is that uh, we are very much a product of a, a team that mes, met in the uh, cross-disciplinary university and, uh, and then in the university CubeSat program. Uh, so the founding team of ISI met in the Alta one program, you know, just five years ago, uh, and, uh, and then we've come, we've come this far. And so it's a perfect example of, of, of the, edu like the role of education, both kind of very basic education, but also, also the specific type of programs that, that can lead into uh, sort of new ideas you know, springing forward. Um, and R&D financing, it's, it's something that Europe and you know, Finland specifically to, to us you know, has, has seemed to do very well, that the early stage R&D financing in this type of extremely deep tech type stuff where, where uh, we had to build a prototype of a you know, completely new instrument. You know, there was, like, this type of radar instrument had never been built before that goes into such a small satellite and we really, really started from scratch. Uh, so, so, that, the, so the risk was massive, uh, but, but the government in an early stage you know, was, able to, or was able to share that risk and that's been something that, that we've seen that like in the, in the Finnish and more broadly in the European ecosystem has been very well uh, handled and is, 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 you know, continues to be very well handled. Uh, you know, which, like the EU Commission R&D financing, it exists. You know, we are also a Horizon SME instrument recipient and then it played a very crucial part uh, in, in, in the role of, of, of develop, development of, of the early stages. But then private investment is extremely important piece of, of this type of an ecosystem, the sort of high-tech venture capital, because like that's in a way, like if you're taking the road of, of, of aggressively developing 
uh, new technologies uh, as a private company. That's pretty much the only way how you can aggressively build new companies that in a way aren't just research projects. And um, in a way, this is, this, this is the place where we are now. We are standing on the shoulders of these giants and you know, very aggressively building, building a, uh, a, a project forward into you know, a very large vision. Um, but you know, how to make this type of an ecosystem to grow and, and make it sustainable. In short term, it's, 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 it's about money. Money rules the world, it's about business. It's about Europe getting any foothold in this new race of, 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 uh, of, of new space, as, as, as it's called. And, um, and just a few points to remember there you know, for, for any, uh, any, uh, any, any other teams uh, we're working in this field. Space technology is, is global from day one. There is, there's really nothing that you can you know, achieve by, 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 by staying in your home country or even European level and sort of expect to, expecting to win in the, in the global scale. So in a way you sort of only win or lose in the entire global market. And, and it's very much fine for projects and companies to fail, uh, but you know, just aim big every time. And, so like, and it's actually true that the majority of this type of projects, they even should fail, uh, but, but uh, the goals need to be high enough, because like, that really you know, gets you to the next level innovations. And um, the other thing in, in short term that is extremely important is the growth financing. So if we want companies to stay, like companies like ISI or, or the other sort of uh, technology leader type companies that are building sort of big global infrastructures, if we want them to stay in Europe, to actually be headquartered in Europe, I mean, it at least needs to be a possibility. I mean, in, it, not always it's the right choice business-wise to be headquartered in Europe, but, but, but it at least should be a possibility, and, and this means that, that the growth financing ecosystem, as in private money to fund uh, venture companies, I mean, it would somehow need to appear. It doesn't, it's not easy, we know, uh, but, but, but uh, right now, really, the sort of majority of well-nurtured uh, European, uh, European deep tech companies, you know, just migrate to the US, you know, just because that's where the growth financing money is. So when you're talking about sort of 100 million scale growth, mark, uh, growth financing, you know, when you're sort of trying to take the market on a global scale that you have just created, that's a very, very big gap in, in, in private financing in Europe. And, uh, and it's not necessarily the job of this, this, this panel to, to, to fix that, but, but it's just something to very much pay attention to. And the other is, is, is the sort of the, the business related thing of sort of anchor customers. So um, in US, it is the defense side that buys the early stage stuff, which is the early stage revenue for, for, uh, for, for you know, technology companies that then grow to, to uh, rule the world, so to speak. And uh, so, so the European defense side, I mean, you can see activity there. Commission is, is uh, putting things in, things in play, and uh, we're very happy to see how that, how, how that works out. And, and the other thing is, is, uh, is the Copernicus Contributing Mission Budget, where we believe that now, of course, now specifically talking about uh, you know, Earth observation and, uh, and, and that sort of you know, businesses related to that, uh, we sort of believe that purchasing the most frequent, most cost-effective, and most modern data you know, should be done from private industry as a service, and, uh, and then maintaining long-term data sets by bespoke satellites you know, built uh, as, 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 a, as a sort of mission budget. And, uh, and then this, is, this has the same role of sort of serving as a really noticeable anchor customer, uh, which like, you know, the Copernicus budgets in total, I mean, they by all means, you know, can rival the, the, the amount of money that, say, the U.S. You know, uh, intelligence community is, is spending in, in buying data from, from private space companies. And uh, so in that sense, it is a really, it is a tool that should be used to, to make sure that the European new space is, is, is uh, you know, really maintains a chance to be competitive. Um, and remaining on the sustainability going forward in sort of midterm, um, then it's about sort of creating those new markets and then it's about owning them, you know, when you have a foothold in the race at all. And, uh, and that's where you come into the questions of, of self-regulation, regulation in international you know, scale, when it's about keeping space usable. Obviously, we should care about it now, uh, but in a way, like, as a company, 
you know, we can't really care about it if we don't exist. So, so, uh, so, so that's, that's why it, it, it comes in, comes in this, this, this point in time. And we are doing a fair amount of things to, to, to make, make it so that the um, uh, space remains usable in, in the future. But of course, this is, this is something where more international collaboration and uh, maybe, maybe this is, you know, one of the key topics for the panel too, so I will uh, not go too deep on that. Uh, legislation is another thing that can, you know, can usually never really create success, but can very many times, you know, destroy success. Uh, um, Finland is an interesting proving ground in a sense that the Finnish Space Act was signed into law, you know, the very same day as, as our first satellite got launched. So, uh, so, so there's a sort of fresh, uh, fresh uh, ground to, to build on top, and uh, and then the, the, there's a there's a lot of a lot of interesting development that, that we can do together. To, to uh, make make some uh, new ways to to uh, to, to interpret uh, the the uh, or like you know to create legislation so that you can incorporate things like um, uh, the sort of you know debris mitigation ethics type things in in, in the legislation and and it's like you know these are things that can be uh, also places where you demonstrate leadership and uh, demonstrating leadership can be something that then 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 actually. Uh, Say gets you know people to gravitate rather towards Europe than than, than somewhere else, um, and of course research, education, the next generation of innovative technologies, next generation of doers, uh, absolutely necessary to, to make sure that the, uh, the the ecosystem stays alive and then grows grow, grows healthy in a sustainable way, and um, and as said so the early stage financing ecosystem is getting there in Europe uh, it's, it's it's growing. Uh, the the, the uh, let's say the growth stage financing is, is really struggling still, but that's something to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, and then collaboration in general. So there are already many great examples of new space companies, uh, research, research in hardware technologies, downstream applications, and then making sure that that, that the ecosystem has you know the, the right forums to 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 play together. Uh, you know. First locally and then globally uh, is, is is very important, and uh, I think in 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 closing side the the long term things to make sure that things remain sustainable, you know then it really is about making you know sure that the world exists at all. So so we're talking about sustainability, you know in 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 the uh, grand scale of things where it is about the climate action. Uh, like those things already need to be in motion. And of course, space plays a big role in in prevent, uh, preventing uh, climate change effects, uh, or let's say monitoring them. And also, space will play a big role in mitigation of those effects, whatever they will end up being. Um, and that's why investing in, in space technology in general right now is, is very much, very very much a good bet uh, towards the future. And um, and I think that hopefully, at least in this room, we have a shared vision in a way that why we believe in, uh, in space technology being, let's say, more than just making money, uh, that, that even if it you know, sounds a bit corny, the space is the next frontier, and, uh, and I hope we all believe in, in pushing humanity forward. Thank you. Thank you, Pekka, for that inspiring keynote. Just to find out how well you did, Pekka, I'm going to ask the audience a question. How many of you, if you had the money, would invest $100 million in Ice Eye? The majority! You see there, your money problems are over! Congratulations, Pekka! Ladies and gentlemen, I think the, I, the, the topic of collaboration at the European level and globally is extremely important. Where I, I slightly disagree with Pekka is, is perhaps as a lawyer, I, I really believe that developing standards is even more about ethics. It's about developing a platform for success. I come from the telecom industry and without a joint effort back in the early 90s to have a standard called GSM, we never would have gotten the great ride that we got in telecom. So this is the next frontier also for the future of the industries. How do we create standards together, platforms together, working together to take that share of the global market that Pekka talked about? And nobody is better than the people in the next 
panel to discuss this very important topic of these ecosystems to develop sustainable growth. Our, our um, moderator for the next panel is, is uh, somebody who's truly inspiring. He has a, a great title. He's very few people can be called this. He is a space educator. Not very, not very many people can be called space educators, but he is a space educator with a big S. He's a leader of the first Finnish satellite program, mentor of several space startups such as uh, IceEye, co-founder um, co of startup companies in the space sector, creator of the biggest new space event in Scandinavia, a SAR remote sensing specialist. The list is long, so I'm going to stop here. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your warmest welcome to Professor Jan Prax. So, thank you very much. Uh, I would start slowly now the panel of creating new space ecosystems for sustainable growth. And first, I would like to set the scene with a couple of words about this topic. So, as we saw, and Becca was telling, um, the new economy in space sector is already sprouting. Uh, companies are growing bigger and bigger. They soon have more satellites than the old companies, and they are already delivering services. Space becomes a business sector in a, in a totally new way. They enter the uh, actual consumer market. And this economy, I believe, will drive the development and provide the future services. And this economy will define also our competitiveness in the future, in the global arena. So how to garden this economy? How to keep it growing? And how to keep it in sustainable path, we're going to discuss now in this panel. And let me introduce the members of the, of the panel in uh, not any particular order. But uh, first of all, we have Axel Ronneke, uh, who is a seasoned space professional, vice president of marketing and sales of Ruach Space. So, Axel, welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ruach Space is a old space sector company. They have been existing as long as European Space Agency, and they have wonderful 100% success in space. So, the next speaker or the next panelist will be Lauri Oksanen, an unmatched specialist of communication technologies, especially wireless technologies, vice president of research and technology of Nokia. <laughs> Welcome, Lauri. Our next panelist is uh, Pascal Claudel, a veteran of European space industry who has been working in many, many different branches of industries from launchers to services. And he is a chief operating officer of European Genesis Agency. Uh, Pascal, welcome to the <laughs> panel. Now we go to the more a business sector, a startupper, Cohen Johnson, space enthusiast, startupper, entrepreneur, organizer, co-founder of uh, Hyber, and director of business intelligence of Hyber. So, Cohen, welcome to the stage. <laughs> and of course, as it was already told before, None of these wonderful things will happen without money. So we're going to have on the stage wonderful Uli Fricke, an innovator, pioneer, investor, and the chairwoman of the European Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. Welcome, Uli. <laughs> so let's discuss how we are getting forward and maybe how did we got here. So I would start with uh, Axel. So you have been with Ruach Space. Ruach Space has been uh, in business a very long time, very successfully. Uh, you are in five different countries. How did you do it? Well, Jan, I think 
this is a great moment to speak about sustainable economy and, and space because we have two things that are happening at the same time. One, we have the problem of how do we organize a planet with 10 billion people and we heard a lot about these problems and everyone seems to realize that when you have global challenges like that, you can only answer with global answers and space is one of them. Um, the second is, and this is something that hasn't been addressed really in, in, the, in, the, in the today, is how our economy is changing, and it's changing because of that. Uh, but it's also changing because we are getting a, an economy going that is self-sustained, in the sense that we are having companies like ISI that are making money with their services. They're not relying on institutional investment in the infrastructure, they're relying on service contracts. Um, what is changing for us at a com as a company that has been in this sector for a long time is also the business model and it's not been changing in the last five years. It's been changing over a certain period of time. Um, already when the size of the market that we could address in certain institutional business in Europe was not large enough to become a product manufacturer. Today, Ruach started 40 years ago as a developer for specific ESA missions. And today we are a product company. That means we are trying to sell uh, product modules or building blocks that go into various applications across several markets. And this is only doable if you start uh, addressing commonalities and if you're addressing several market segments. Um, today we are selling approximately e equally into the institutional market in Europe, in the US, and also the commercial market. The second, I think, secret of success is how do you keep agility in growing? And the method that Ruach has been using is that of entrepreneurial cells. So we have uh, 12 entrepreneurial cells as product units that are self-sustained, that have everything from marketing and sales to integration, and they have their set of products that they sell globally on the market. And then we organize that through product groups, but it's a very agile network that can address various programs or various markets in reconfigurable ways. And that is why I think we have been also been able to anticipate some of the changes. I'm just uh, uh, remembering four and a half years ago, I just joined, joined Ruach and we had a conference call with OneWeb when they told us we, they needed a production rate of 10 satellites per week. And I'm glad this was a telecon because you could, I would have loved to show you the faces of some of my colleagues. So we, we really, we were able to address these challenges in a fairly reasonable amount of time. And we were also able to change from the traditional, you know, ESA standard type of, you know, super reliable to how can we make a product module that is capable of either addressing a two and a half or three year lifetime LEO satellite, low radiation, and using a similar computer architecture for a longer term. And the benefit for, for, for obviously the institutional programs, both with the commercial side and with the, the, the higher volume business is really the fact that we can transform and use what we learned in one area of the sector and bring the benefit to the other. Okay, thank you very much. So I think uh, one of the biggest promises at the moment, what we are waiting, is the development of the communication market. So we have two communication companies here in the panel, and I would actually like to ask Cohen, you first. Uh, so first of all, why Hyber? did what it did, so striving to become the biggest IoT uh, network provider in the world, and not Ruag. So what do you do differently? Why you think you will win? Well, let's start off with a very simple concept which was told by, uh, I wouldn't say competition, because I don't think we're in the same field there, but uh, when it comes to agility, I just heard a five-year time frame, which to us as a startup, it's probably a five-month time frame. So that is, you know, a big difference between how larger, well-established companies work and how startups work. But to continue um, and basically making you understand how we started off with Hyber itself, 
it was really funny because about five years ago, I started looking into investment opportunities in the space market. And I met with the people from ISI, for example. So that was a very funny way, um, hearing back their successes over time, and therefore also seeing what the market is really doing. For about a year, we invested in several companies. Uh, we lost quite some money, uh, because that's what you do as you are early stage and first time investor as well. But we learned enough about the market to see a real opportunity. Because the miniaturization of small satellites have came with tons of new opportunities, and that's what we all call the, the new space era, so to say. So that on the one hand, small satellites came up with tons of new opportunities for us. At the other hand, we were researching the Internet of Things, so IoT in short, for quite some time as well. And in the research papers, we saw that deployments were going to happen in five years' time. And we saw that in research papers from 10 years ago. So where were the deployments? But finally, millions and millions of devices have been connected in the uh, non-urban areas, I would say. And this is also the first time that there are more devices, so more things are connected than human people. So that's why we said, okay, if Internet of Things is really taking off, let's make sure it can get connected anywhere in the globe, because Wi-Fi, GSM, Bluetooth, you name them, only connect about 10% of the world, which is similar to what ISI saw as well for their infrastructure plan. So combining IoT connectivity requirements with what small satellites have to offer, we said, okay, let's start with just one satellite up in space, because with that we can already provide a daily service from a commercial point of view. So also different from the um, commercial services that you see from the OneWebs, that you see from um, the larger mega constellations where people are talking about billions and billions required to start your service, we said, well, let's not forget about the small amounts of data required by the sensors that are out in the open. And therefore, we could start our business from a minimal viable product already with just one satellite. And by the way, we have two now in orbit. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then I would like to go to the next communication company here on the panel. So definitely the biggest company here in the, our panel is Nokia. And Nokia is also an example of sustainable, uh, striving company. They started years and years and years ago with the cables and rubber boots uh, before even cell phones were invented. So, Lauri, how do you see the market is changing now when these small startup companies come to the communication area where you have been working already for 28 years with different kind of, of uh, wireless technologies? So how this will change the market or does it change the market? Well, we like to think of ourselves as a very sustainable company for also we have been doing very well in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, for example, referring to the earlier panel. but. Um, we, we uh, like to see it in technology innovation. Uh, we just, for example, had a startup uh, comp uh, competition for startup companies in IoT field where we got very interesting winners we are going to cooperate with. So we are looking for innovation everywhere. We, we don't invent everything ourselves, even though we invented the transistor and those little stuff but some time ago with Bell Labs. But, uh, but uh, we, we look for innovation and, and we use, like how I actually explain, if somebody asks me very simple, uh, uh, like uh, give a short explanation what Nokia does I say we do everything in communication except satellites and, uh, and but we use satellites in various forms we use them as backhaul for our networks we use them we have a techno like a platform as a service called wing where we, provi where we provide IOT connectivity for anybody anywhere in the world already and we do, we are a service provider there through our operator partners and we use obviously the networks all the, the networks that we need satellites in, in oceans and uh, earth earth based networks elsewhere so we use all the technologies needed to solve the problems of our customers which are not just telecom operators but more and more uh, other enterprises and um, so we, we like to see the innovation and we like to see and have them as partners if they have a, a suitable technology and suitable services for us to utilize. I, I think also if uh, like in an earlier keynote what Hassan Malik says that said that uh, uh, 5G and satellites are per the perfect combination and I don't know if it's a perfect combination but definitely we see them as complementary and as a combination 
both have their uh, uh, kind of strong points and um, we will certainly utilize both. Also looking into longer term, 5G technology is going to be standardized in next release of 3GPP also for non-terrestrial uses. So we look forward to being, eight, uh, first we'll of course participate and drive the standard because we are one of the biggest in standardization there. But then we will uh, develop products and technology for maybe for satellite companies to use our technology uh, on the ground stations, uh, on the uh, satellites, wherever. So, so we definitely look more uh, look for more engagement in the future, also ourselves and 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 all innovative small companies are very welcome to work with us. Thank you very much, Lauri. So, Pascal, you are representing an agency, a European agency, which is uh, strives to increase the market uptake of satellite data especially GNSS, and uh, your, your agency is pro providing basically the, the European navigation signal, Galileo signal. How do you see how this signal forms, uh, forms an infrastructure for, for the business in, in Europe? Or is it even related? At least I believe no small uh, startup company starts to um, create navigation satellites in space anytime soon. How it belongs to this? ecosystem? Uh, yes. <laughs> First, uh, if I may, then GSA, it's a European Union agency. Uh, it's an operational agency of the European Commission, uh, as you said, uh, for uh, Galileo and EGNOS, both uh, navigation system uh, by satellite. Uh, and the objective uh, of, the, of the agency is is for the sustainable development, in fact. The first uh, objective is to deliver uh, services, uh, services of Galileo 24-7 uh, for all users, civil, professional, and governmental, and also to foster uh, the use of data coming from space, uh, to develop uh, in all uh, segment market, uh, to develop uh, tools uh, to develop apps uh, and receiver and uh, with uh, these uh, these tools in fact we serve uh, uh, today the, the sustainable uh, development why uh, today the result uh, with uh, with the use of uh, galileo uh, we, we can, sorry we can uh, give several figures to illustrate uh, how we can support uh, the, um, the economic growth in fact, uh, we have about uh, 50,000 uh, 50, uh, 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 jobs created uh, due to that with the new, uh, with these services. And also, uh, we, um, we have a revenue of about uh, 60 uh, billion euro uh, by 2027. And so with that, we support a lot uh, with, uh, with uh, SMEs and industry. And uh, to, tomorrow, with, um, with the new regulation, we will have also a new uh, additional uh, scope with uh, Copernicus and GovSatcom and uh, uh, space uh, surveillance. And with that, we can have a synergy with uh, all space programs. And with synergy and with uh, our know-how acquired with Galileo, we can support better uh, these SMEs. Thank you very much. And, so, and so I think we can also involve all EU countries in these uh, in this uh, job because, uh, in fact, it's not necessary to have uh, knowledge in space uh, to develop receiver and apps. And it's why uh, this agency is user oriented, and we can support all uh, market segment. Yeah, I think think, think uh, that this navigation uh, signal is. Uh, a really wonderful ex, uh, example of a service which people don't know even anymore, that it's coming actually from space sector. They use it and they, they need it and it actually runs the economy. But uh, let's come back to the markets and, and development. And Uli, you are a very experienced uh, investor and you have through the different organizations a broad view to the market, including space market. So how do you think in Europe, um, how it develops, do we have a market, do we have enough startups, and how is the activity in the space sector, how it is looking to investors? Thank you. V very, very good uh, questions. 
Do we have a market? Of course we have a market. Um, everybody uses space, um, and you just said it yourself, most of the time without realizing is, do we have startups? We, we only have to look around the room and around the building yesterday and today to see how many startups we have, and this is only a fraction of those that are in Europe. Um, do we have a funding ecosystem that can get the startups from their first financing round to the IPO? That is probably the number one bottleneck we have in Europe. And we have a lot of data um, that has been collected in recent years to understand the substantial intrinsic difference of the European venture capital ecosystem compared to the American one. It has many reasons why we are where we are. We have lots of proposals on the table that some of them have been implemented on the um, European level, on national levels, that will come to fruition. So some things will be solved over time, but still today um, we have some substantial funding gaps. Um, some were pointed out by PECA, um, they come at the really late stages in pre-IPO funding rounds, others are in, in earlier stages, and what can we do about it is the, the question on a basis on which we have control. And there's a number of ideas um, I'd like to share, quick ideas. First of all, i like to give a quick story. Um, two weeks ago, I was part of a jury that awarded 17.5 million euros to a space startup in Europe. Um, why? Not because we're talking about building yet another satellite constellation, not because we're talking about the best technology up there, the most innovative sensors, what have you. This was a broadcasting story, so. Um, but because it was very clear what the business model of this company was about. Who are the customers? What are they paying for? Why is this valuable to the customer? And how do you reach those customers? These were the questions the investors were worried about. We always are worried about. Um, so sometimes I believe we have to take out the space of the space technology companies in order to answer the questions that investors worry about. And that is related to the fact that how do we perceive risk? And let's not kid ourselves. Perception here is reality. If the investors think the risk is there is no business model, then that's this investor's reality and you will not get money from that investor if you can't answer those questions. So that's number one. Number, so a, a fix in the, or a change in the mindset of how we approach our own companies when talking to investors. Second, um, maybe we have to bring our space startups and scale-up companies to where the investors are. I mean, this is a meeting of space people here, and it's super exciting for me as an investor to be here. I love it. I take part of these events for many, many years now because I get as excited as everybody else in the room about space and the opportunities that are there. <clears throat> but how many others in, uh, other investors are here? But investors go to events. They go to a slush conference. They go to Republika in Berlin. They go to many events, why not take our st space startups and growth companies to where those investors are, rather than expect investors to come? Because investors have enough investment opportunities. It's not a shortage for us to find money, to companies to invest in. And thirdly, I think we have to celebrate our success stories, because we have them. We have the ice eyes, we have the hybers, we have actually companies that went from um, being at an ESA big incubation center or a German um, space incubation center to being listed on Frankfurt Stock Exchange within only seven years. That's super exciting success stories. These we have to celebrate and talk about and put in front of investors because actually investors go, and again, perception is reality, where they think they can make money. Thank you very much. I think, yes, we have 
an ecosystem, we have money, we have activity, everything goes forward, but we are sitting here to make it more smooth. Somehow let's like oil the system and get it faster. So I would actually give the next question to Cohen. So you have been going through this washing machine yourself uh, with your startup company. Where are the bottlenecks? So was it easy to get your funding? What are the keys to be here now? Okay, I hope that I don't continue for the rest of the hour, but uh, <laughs> there were some challenges, and there still are, so don't you worry. Um, but coming back to what you mentioned about the perception, that is really funny, because when we founded the company, our name was Magnitude Space. Because Magnitude, we're gonna make a huge impact on the world, always been our number one value, basically. And space, because space is sexy, space is cool, space is what we do. Um, but about a year later, about one and a half years later maybe, we changed it into hybrid. Because space, whether it's perceived or real, comes with high cost and high risk. And we are a low cost player, which is very reliable. So it doesn't add up. So we changed our name to something that we actually do, we hibernate, right? So we are sleeping the whole time. So the little modem that we have, including the antenna, they are sleeping on the ground over 99% of the time to be very power efficient. And therefore, you know, they can be put in the field for five years without even a solar panel. Coming back to other challenges though, we have been um, going to a tremendous amount of challenges, I would say, because together with my co-founders, who are also co-founders of companies like Treatwell, Just Eat and Booking.com, we come from an online business. We are not the spin out of a university with all kinds of crazy space ideas. We come from a business mindset and then saw an opportunity which happened to be in space. So we had to prove to a lot of people that we were capable of building a satellite, developing that all of ourselves, which of course we couldn't because we didn't have the money, we didn't have the knowledge, we basically didn't have anything. So we went out to the ecosystem, which in Europe is available when it comes to small satellites, so that is great. And together with them and the European Space Agency, we developed our first satellites and therefore, and we are not allowed to say it, but we always say it is validated by ESA, so don't you worry. That's what we say to investors, we don't say that to ESA, of course. <laughs> so um, somehow we checked off the technology part and with those contracts in place, we could find investors who are capable of putting a large amount of money in place. But even if I had the question from earlier on, if you would have 100 million, would you put it in ISI? I raised my hand, because I wanted to do it very early on as well. However, we have several billionaires investing in our company, but no way they are investing billions of dollars in our company, right? So another issue is even the money might be available, the risk is still there, and they want to share that risk with the people around them, which they know from their own ecosystem within the investment world. So little bit by little bit, we pushed and we got more money in, a little bit of help from the government as well. And you know, that is basically how we kept on, not saying it's a total um, shoe strain budget, so to say, but we got to a point where we finally got a salary, for example, once in three years time, that would be nice. So it's not easy finding a company, but it's also when I come all the way to the lunch I had earlier here today, I had a very nice, surprise because somebody asked me so what is you know your number one issue and uh, the lady next to me told me it's probably money I said no it's time and then the person next to me said well money is time I said no you don't understand we are not efficient as a startup we throw money around all the time you know trying stuff that's not efficient but we have to learn much quicker because otherwise if we want to do it the correct way if we want to do it the easy way even if we want to do the ESA light way, we're going nowhere. So to speed up that whole process, we're going to make mistakes. And we must learn from those mistakes. So, you know, the number one issue we have in our learning cycle is that launching a satellite takes forever. And while changing a website goes overnight. And we very much position ourselves as a data player, much more on the online part, because our customers don't care whether the data comes via satellite or not, they just want to have the data to take action. 
And that is a total shift in mindset. So I hope with these examples, I gave a little bit of an answer to that question. Yeah, thank you very much. So I also happen to know that one of the big resources, which probably is behind of your success, is uh, having a right frequency license. And uh, this is a question I would touch upon with Lauri. So you have a, a long experience in uh, terrestrial communication, wireless communication, and I, I, know, I honestly think that terrestrial communication has been going through many similar development stages than uh, space communication will start to go through. Uh, so how do you see the spectrum usage uh, for, for you and space? And can we live in the same spectrum I think there is already like small clashes happening. Yes, and um, like in a telecoms or terrestrial spectrum for mobile and other use, we are already, let's say, on third or third iteration of how the regulation is done to get it more and more efficient all the time for different use cases. And already a long time ago, um, spectrum was uh, uh, like made technology neutral in the terrestrial side. And also like the fun when the fundamental issues uh, or let's say uh, positive uh, enablers has been that uh, uh, that uh, the techno that the spectrum has been allocated to service providers which then provide connectivity for multiple use cases and multiple users literally millions of people or hundreds of millions of people in Europe and all and all the IoT and other use cases so this is uh, um, as i understand it in uh, so in, in satellites still uh, often, basically, if you want to have your satellite communicate, you have to have a, 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 spe a specific spectrum license for your satellite. And, and, and this is, from a ter terrestrial point of view, that's a huge waste. So basically, like, I think that what could be considered for space is that there would be a, for example, for the connectivity part, a connectivity operator or multiple of those which would have the spectrum licenses, and then they would provide connectivity to multiple, like, observation satellites or other satellites, which would then all everybody would be able to benefit from higher bandwidth and um, probably even better service because this one uh, connectivity provider could invest much more in the connectivity. So, uh, so I think that there are op opportunities in there to go, and it has not be it has been painful in the in the um, uh, terrestrial world also because there are always vested interests and there are players who are afraid. Okay, does, can I get the quality of services when I manage this myself? I know what to do. But we have shown that you can have service providers who can obey and, and provide a service level agreements and do it. And now we are already moving further, so we are, do, we are doing shared spectrum. For example, CBRS in US starts uh, starting commercially and similar in uh, other places where we are going to use the same spectrum um, multiple times, in, for example, in a given country, in small areas, and in specific time frames. So we are going to much, much more dynamic usage of spectrum and getting much more out of it with lower costs for everybody and better service for everybody. It's critical that we they do it carefully and uh, as we also will be if satellite goes that way so that you can actually provide, technically you can provide the service of the guarantees needed, but we have shown that yes, you can when you do design the system pr uh, in, a pr in a proper way, and then it's just that the business models will follow for sure. When when there is business opportunity, then there, that will follow. So uh, we could maybe think that in 4G and 5G, Europe has been a leading role in uh, in uh, developing these standards. So in order to foster the the ecosystem here in Europe, we could also do something in uh, in a direction of space. Uh, frequency usage and could be beneficial for the for the ecosystem in Europe as well. It, it could be and of course the other thing so it's not just a spectrum use but it's that we have uh, been able to agree on terrestrial use uh, on some major technologies like Wi-Fi pr uh, practically has 90% of the unlicensed like communications and, and connectivity and then uh, 4G now has uh, like 90% pretty much of the uh, wide area connectivity, and then there are, and then there are a few standards on IoT and others also which have their uh, places, but there are a very limited number, and these are general pl uh, purpose use. When we have uh, sp uh, spectrum regulation, so it's uh, not kind of tied to the use users, but uh, rather tied to the service provider who, ca who serves multiple users. And then we have these general purpose connectivity technologies which can be used on the spectrum. So then you get really this efficient usage, at least in uh, terrestrial cases. 
Yeah, in order to agree something on, on, on the spectrum or frequencies, it needs a lot of collaboration. And I think Europe is a is, uh, world leader in actually doing collaboration. It's sometimes slow and it's sometimes not so easy, but we do a lot col of collaboration. So, Axel, I would actually ask you uh, the next. So, I think you are the, the one of the good examples how space collaboration will bring sustainability to your to your company. So we need to make it work because we're we're in uh, six different countries with 14 different units. Exactly. Can you tell how it works? How you fit it um, all together? I think one of the main topics is that you need to be able to network and not have a functional organization that you try to let's say force onto a large organization which is distributed in space. I think that is one of the uh, prerequisites and you need to have these different operations act like entrepreneurs which is super difficult if you at the same time also work in environments where you have 10 years of development time. So what we have done is we've created KPIs to get people's mindset oriented towards how fast can you actually sell this what you develop. And uh, so we have reduced KPIs from two years or so to six months. And that was our goal, and we're doing this in various of our product areas. Um, this is, by the way, also something that, that, that came to my mind when I heard the struggles. We're also doing a lot of um, co-engineering with our customers. Um, in, we don't wait for requirements to be settled. We, we actually come in, and we also do that more and more often with startup companies. They, once they started to like working with us, and this is a question of trust and, and, and having the right people and the right mindset, um, going in early and helping to optimize a system design for cost or for development speed is what we bring in in a partnership with our customer. Um, the last one is that, that collaboration in Europe, which is sometimes coming through regulation or coming through certain procurement rules, actually has helped us to also find interesting technology partners. We work with SMEs in Poland and Greece, for example, at the moment. Um, and this is, th we actually, this is cool stuff. So technology input is coming through that way as well. Um, and then one, one word, last word on investor pitches. So if I have to go with a project uh, that requires 10 million investment, um, and I don't have an anchor customer, that's why I like the, the comment from Pekka. Uh, if I, d I don't have credibility, I can go home. So credibility is everything in, in actually making uh, people trust you and give you money. I had a, a former boss that always said, would you invest 100K in this project? And, and that was also a good question that I, um, so would you invest a year's salary in, 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 in such a venture? That is always a good, so educating and helping our people to be entrepreneurs is the key. So you, you, you think it's not about new space or old space, it's more like uh, a continuum and working together with all the levels of, of innovation. It's about mindset and learning and, and uh, uh, fail fast is something that uh, you do all the time. You also mentioned something which is actually very interesting and topical. So you mentioned also the, the space policies and standardization and things which you are involved in. And now we can come back to you, Pascal. Uh, so Europe is developing um, a huge step forward by uniting several programs like Galileo, uh, Copernicus, some other programs to the single policy and single program. And uh, as far as I heard, your office is potentially taking lead on these different kind of, of programs. So it sets it to the, to the um, also a sort of regulative uh, role in Europe. How do you see how this Europe should develop the, the uptake of existing material and data which is flowing already from the space? and how we should develop the regulatory framework for Europe in order to allow this kind of, of uh, striving ecosystem in space sector. Yes, in fact, with the new regulation, uh, 
uh, as uh, of the 1st uh, January 2021, the GSA will uh, be in charge uh, of all uh, EU uh, space program for the market development. And so with that, uh, uh, we, we can use our know-how, as I said before, and also we, we have the synergy between all pro all, uh, all programs to support, uh, to support the economic growth. Um, Yes, we, with the new, the, the objective of this new regulation is, is not to centralize, but to have all uh, all uh, EU programs in the same box, and with that we use uh, all data coming from space, and in, and to materialize uh, with the users how we can use, uh, we can we can have the best use of this data. For example, uh, yesterday we have a user platform here, and with this user's platform, we can uh, work uh, how we can optimize uh, this data. For example, for the civil uh, security, we can use Galileo, Copernicus, and GovSatcom. With Galileo, we can, uh, we can uh, know where you are. With uh, Copernicus, you can uh, see what you have around you, and with GovSatcom, you can collect everyone. And so with that, uh, we can, um, we can uh, answer to the need uh, of users, governmental also, for example, here my example is for uh, civil security, and when you have disaster, you can have uh, tools uh, to answer to that. And the objective of the new regulation is that, in fact, is to mutual all resources, not only technical, but also users, uh, to have the best uh, answer and to use uh, to use uh, better uh, the tools uh, coming from space. So I will continue and uh, ask, uh, do you think there is still, I think at least, there is still potential uh, in European data which is coming from Copernicus and GNSS and, and Galileo programs? And uh, it's in good use, but it could be used much more. And there are countries which are not having space program or not having space law or not doing much in space that they could benefit out of this data and activities quite a bit. Do you think there could be or should be European effort to, to disseminate this um, knowledge and data more widely, involve more of our strengths to, to, to crunch the data? Uh, the answer is yes. In fact, uh, with the upstream, we need to have some uh, knowledge in space, but with the downstream here, to use the data is not necessary to have a specific knowledge in space. And in fact, it's what is easy today to involve all EU countries, uh, to involve all uh, SMEs having no uh, space heritage. It's easy. You, you can merge also uh, artificial intelligence with these, uh, with these uh, competence and with uh, safety. Sorry. <laughs> And with, um, with uh, the IT, with the competence of IT, security, and uh, artificial intelligence, today we can uh, have a leader uh, with the, the use of uh, data coming from space. You speak about new space, old space. The downstream is for the new space, and we can use the old space for old, old space for, uh, to uh, support the manufacture of products, for example, after is in the opposite side, So, my point of view. Yeah, exactly. So, Cohen, what do you think? Do we have sufficient infrastructure here in, in, in Europe? So, do you use Galileo Signal? Uh, do you <coughs> use any space infra in your, in your business? Yeah, so the way we see it is, we, whether it's Galileo or any other GNSS service, we take it as for granted that it is being there. So whether that is a one meter resolution as uh, Galileo is offering, or whether that is around 10 as with GPS, we are happy with any kind of location, as long as it's better than say, you know, it's somewhere with a dart on the, on the globe. Um, and we use that information as well within our services, not only from a commercial side, but also for network purposes within our satellite uh, performance. However, 
taking that question into a, a slightly different way, and, and that's basically a question I would ask to Uli, is if we go back and see what you know, the, the more well-known uh, new space companies have done, they have all built their own satellites. So going all the way to you know, when Planet started, there were no small satellite companies there yet. So they had to do it themselves. Okay, so you know, Planet took over the Earth imaging market, I would say, the Earth observation market. Um, nothing to do with the old space, though. So the traditional satellites still have a place there, right? So it's complementary to one another. If you look at Spire, they basically track every little ship, right, with their AAS and maybe some weather data coming through in uh, in due time as well. They tried it with one of the European uh, satellite guys, but switched back and built the satellites themselves. Now, going here to ISI, they also built most of the satellites themselves. We, at Hyber, we started with one of those satellite manufacturers as well, moving more and more towards building the satellites ourselves. So, Uli, from an investment perspective, because I think this is the main key component there, do you like companies who build up their own knowledge, who build up their own balance sheet, or do you prefer partnerships with large corporates without anything within the company? <laughs> Thank you very much. How much time do we have? So, throwing the question back at you. <laughs> no, uh, joking, joking aside, um, I tell you a secret, but don't quote me. Investors are easily scared. And um, PECA and some, some others uh, mentioned it, infrastructure, unless you are a specific infrastructure investor that has money for 25 years or longer, sounds scary. Um, at the same time, as an investor, we look for creating value in businesses. How do you create value in a business? You create value if you have assets, if you have intellectual property, patents, know-how, and you commercialize this. So um, this is a very un-German answer, yes and no. <laughs> um, it boils down to having a business case, creating credibility by having customers that are willing to pay for your service or product. If, <clears throat> if you have that business case that is credible and you build assets on top of that, then there are investors who will be able and capable to fund that. Not every investor is right for every stage of business. So there's a lot to be talked about which investor fits the, the very first funding round, the second funding round, the pre-IPO funding round. But if there is a business case, credibility, um, assets, investors typically can be found. Okay, so I would actually, before we end, uh, go to the, a big topic, which is uh, space debris. So this is one of the key uh, sustainability issues in a space business as well. Uh, because if there is no room in the orbit anymore, your satellite is getting killed in a couple of months, you cannot have business. So, Uli, I would actually start with you. Do you consider when investing in a company, I don't know, maybe a big constellation, thinking that can they actually pull it off because the stat satellites could start to collide in orbit? Is there any uh, enforcement from investor side that you should develop this business in a sustainable way that we can use space also later on? Okay, <clears throat> more secrets. Um, what drives venture capital or private equity investors? We are driven by the need to raise money from pension funds, insurance companies, pr large institutional investors. We get money from them to invest in innovative companies and they expect us to return money to them. So our first concern, first and foremost concern, is our capability to return three to five times the amount of money we have received from our investors in a period of five to eight years. That's an ambitious target. 
and anything that gets in the way of that target, we have to remove. <clears throat> Protecting our assets, typically our, our investment assets, is a big topic. Um, protecting space assets from space debris is maybe not super high up on the list of priorities, however, because we need money from insurance companies, pension funds, etc., and many of them now have sustainability as some of their criteria, it becomes a box that we have to check, so it becomes more and more relevant to us. So, Axel, what do you think? Is there sustainable space and space debris a topic also for RUAC, or is it like... Uh, let, me, let me give you my, first my personal opinion. So I, I've been, I've been in the, with this question also 10 years ago, so we were trying to raise money for another project. And it was very close, we were this close. There was, a, there was an operator, there was people actually developing the, it's this close. But the business case didn't close because we couldn't answer the question of where the money would be actually coming from selling this service. This was about a tug removing debris and so forth. Um, I think unless we cannot answer that question, we will not get investment from companies investing into the technology and also institutional investors uh, like Uli's. So, and I just had a, had a meeting three weeks ago in the US with, with another company that is trying to make money with this. And we had a very long discussion around this point. They had a super interesting concept. Technically, this was all great. But really the question on how do you build that business case, because someone needs to pay money, insurance company, uh, you know, you can develop also with ESA money a first, first technical concept. You can get the satellite or the tug that does this. But then how you create the business case, that to me, and this is a personal opinion, is not clear at this moment. And I think this is the big obstacle. Okay, Cohen. So you have on the webpage of your company also claims about sustainability and um, like having low orbit satellites and mentioning space debris as well. Mm -hmm. So why? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll answer the question about the satellites real quick because we didn't change our name for nothing. So our next satellites actually have propulsion on board. So as soon as it's end of life, we can just get them back to the atmosphere, have them burn up there, nothing left behind. But when it comes to Hyber, we are more positioning ourselves as a sustainable company. You know, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations are within our DNA. So, you know, we can talk about agricultural use cases where we can make sure that two and a half times more crops can be grown on the same field, which is very nice, but maybe a more cute example, so to say, is that about 35% of all the food is being enabled by bees. And bees' populations, and the fact that they die quite often, is a huge problem for the world. So these bees are used for cross-pollination around the, the food crops, and every six weeks, the whole beehive goes to a different location. They get lost, they don't know where they are, and because the temperature and the sound of, that the bees make, which is a proxy for the health of the bees, is not being monitored on a daily basis, they die. So what we do as one of our use cases, and there are over 60 million of these beehives in remote areas, just so you know what the market is, we are monitoring them, giving the owner of the beehives a, a heads up that they have to act on the fact that the, the bees are not happy anymore. And therefore we at Hyber will never help, well we will help, but we'll never solve who, world hunger from that perspective, but we are enabling other people to actually put the good things in place. And, and that's what we are very proud of at Hyber as well. So these small companies are actually contributing on the, on the sustainable living with 10 billion people soon on this planet. So I totally agree. We cannot manage without, without, without uh, space segment and also partially private space segment. However, I would like to come back to the space debris issue. So there was a, a mention that, of course, private funds, they need to make profit. Uh, nothing happens without money. And now I'm coming back to you, Pascal. What do you think? Could there be a pan-European policy of nations together, all the governments together, 
buying off space debris from orbit by creating a market for, 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 for actually going after, after the debris. Because I'm seeing the same problem that there is nobody actually interested uh, in the business perspective uh, of removing the debris before somebody actually paying for it. And this is a big policy, maybe worldwide global problem, maybe we could start in Europe. What do you think? Well, first, today there is a, a program, is uh, SSC, Surveillance uh, of Space. In several uh, countries in Europe, uh, we manage, we monitor the debris in orbit, and also in several countries, we have a space law to, uh, to avoid uh, this uh, situation. For example, uh, in, my, uh, in my previous job uh, at Ariane Espace, uh, when we launch uh, a launcher, uh, we need uh, to deorbit uh, the upper stage to avoid to have a debris in orbit. And it's, all, it's also the case with several uh, manufacturers of satellites. Donc, so today we have solution. And I think if we force to have this solution through a role, uh, a, a European role and also a ONU role, because in Europe, I think you are a good uh, student. It's not the same case within other uh, nations. For example, today when we uh, deorbit the launcher, it's not the same case with uh, USA. And so, it, in fact, it's why uh, you're right. We need to implement a role, but not only in EU, also uh, all over the world. But I, I think it's not complicated to manage the debris in orbit if we integrate uh, when you launch a satellite uh, and a launcher uh, because the technology exists. But there is, a there, there is a cost, and the problem is the cost today. So if we integrate the cost inside, it's not a problem. Yeah, of but course. But we, we need to force to go in this way. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a big thing to agree on. I'm, I'm totally agree. So I think we all agree that uh, the small companies and the space sector is in a key role in the future. We need, we need to grow it. Uh, we need to uh, foster it. We need to help it. I think also we need to pay more attention on education, what we give on this, uh, this area. But uh, let's imagine that we build a big European-wide greenhouse and we start to grow space startups and space companies and space ecosystem inside this greenhouse. So I would like to make a, a small round now that you all will give your take. What is the first thing you think you should do or, or your company or what we should do in order to make this greenhouse green? from inside. So let's start with Axel, with you from this end and come here. So what are the things to do in next five, ten years to make European space ecosystem greenhouse flourish? I think there's two things that come to my mind. Um, one is we can put there all the ideas and technologies that we decided not to fund for various reasons and we don't have time to worry about and I would like to put that there and make a competition together with Uli and together with Cohen and we'll find, find people who want to do that. That would be the first thing I would like to do. The second thing is I would like to have a set of our trainees and our com upcoming managers to spend two years on one of these topics or maybe two of these topics inside that greenhouse and then com rotate, come back in, into uh, their next role. And maybe we have this as a, as a standard process that every project manager that has completed a large program has to go back to that greenhouse and build his new business there. I hope politicians are making notes at the moment. Laude. Okay, so I would actually come back again to the keynote by uh, Malik. So. The, uh, he had a uh, kind of a circle there, which it was a line on his, I use it as a triangle usually, which is basically in IoT, what you want to do is you want to learn data, you want to analyze it, you want to decide on it, and then you want to control what you have. And that brings you efficiency for sustainability, for profitability, whatever. So 
I would like to us to look things from that point of view. So what do we want to enable and not get stuck on technologies, but really utilize the best technologies, whether they are space or whatever, and um, whether it's edge computing or centralized or all those things. And, uh, and also then really enable that by regulation. So break down the barriers. Telecoms was, has been a great scalable success because barriers have been broken down in regulation uh, many years ago and again and again and are now again being broken. So that always brings innovation and efficiency. When it's it also hurts some old players, but it's better to go with the flow and, and be at the forefront and uh, there. So regulation should enable new models and, uh, and uh, really then, let's say, the people in the greenhouse should focus on what problem they are solving rather than what hammers they happen to have in their hand. Okay, thank you. Pascal. Yes. To go in this way, I think we need to work together today. We need to involve all EU countries. It's not the case with, uh, today. I think we need uh, to, to unite all partners, <coughs> public, private, and to have the same objective, to, to to build this greenhouse, we need to work together. It's not the case. And I think if we want to, 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 to build this Europe, it's easy. But we need to want to go in this way, together. OK, it's thank you. It's my message. Cohen. Yeah, so for those who have been here uh, during the last panel as well, I would team up with Thomas. I think education is key. Uh, I would actually want to make sure that people in Europe have the same mindset when it comes to entrepreneurship. Um, you know, there are an unlimited amount of reasons why there are different uh, capital markets between the US area and in Europe. But one of them as well is the mindset of the entrepreneur. So I, I just want to educate people there as well. Okay, we have a greenhouse with lots of smart people, well-educated, super hardworking. We have collaboration schemes and regulatory frameworks in place. I think I throw a party because we should not forget to have fun at the end of the day as well. Let's go to All the right, that was, that, was, that was really important, really great. So, however, I'm not stopping here right now, although this would be absolutely wonderful ending words. I'm still asking, is there anybody uh, from the audience who would like to ask a question? Yes, there is a question. So do we have somebody with mics? Uh, well, it's not because I promised to one of the panel member that I will put the question. It's because really it's very enthusiastic as a debate. And I, he I have uh, Florian Pong from Safe Cluster and colleagues on the jury with Frike. Um, fully agree with you, Frike, when you say business model, business case, we need it. But we discussed since two days here about who's paying for monitoring the environment, who's paying for monitoring the pollution. And let me tell you, there is no market. Nobody is paying to monitor pollution. Nobody. And it's, it's sad, I will say. It's sad. We have 70,000 deaths per year due to pollution in the European Union. And still, we don't buy uh, sensors for nitrogen and so on. Uh, I think here we face a paradigm between private fears private interest, uh, the, the process who launch the decision to buy something for an individual against his public representation. Because for pollution sensors, only a uh, mayor is paying if he has money at the city budget. If not, he will not pay. So I was thinking to clean ocean, um, and he rose money from an aggregating platform of fears of persons from the plastic into the oceans through Kickstarter. Again, we need platforms aggregating interest from private person. If not, we're going to never have money for such a... It, it's, it's wild, I will say. It's weird. But we are humans and we are working like this. And I think the paradigm is not on business model. It's 
private versus public representances of each individual interest and fears, because we are speaking about commonalities. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we all very much agree. Yeah. Uh, the, the second question is more to Axel, mindset. I really agree, mindset. But let's do a hyperbole. Push, push till the end the, the, the rationale and um, let's say when a public institution will give some billions to a private person to develop a new generation of a space launcher. That's, that's the mindset in America and this is not the mindset here. So the person that initiated that mindset at NASA um, once told me that uh, the change of mindset was we're not controlling technology but we are going to have the power of choice. That was the main driver that made that mindset set going. And I think, honestly, since we b work with both institutions, NASA and ESA, I think we, are, we can be proud in some areas of ESA how we have been working that mindset without such a radical change in the, let's say, procurement policy, in the way we handle contract, in the way we also um, harvest IP. So I think, personally, comparing also the two systems, I think we're pretty good at ESA in that respect. However, and here comes the uh, real problem, is we're looking at a market in Europe that if you are favorably comparing, we are a factor of five smaller than what you're looking at in the US. So if you have such a difference in market size, you can play different games. And that pertains to launchers, that pertains also to infrastructure, although you don't like that term. But it's really what we are trying, and this is the reason why a lot of these things are still institutional, my opinion, in Europe. And we need to become better in managing this limited size market uh, and making the most out of it. I think so far we have been doing quite well, but the challenges that will come with the change of the overall industrial landscape, we have to hurry up. And I think Pierre made that comment today that we, we cannot rest. We cannot say, okay, we have probably five times more competitive industry, but this is pure necessity because if that industry weren't at that, above that threshold, we wouldn't be able to deliver competitively at all. Okay, Uli would like to, quick note. Very quick, uh, Florin, thank you for the question. The beauty today is, I think, that um, the problem is acknowledged, but there is so many different sources of capital for different stages of company, different kinds of projects, there's public money, there is money from private individuals collected through online platform. There is early stage venture capital, late stage stock exchanges, private equity. And while also business opportunities evolve from areas that are today no business opportunities, also investment capabilities evolve. So there is a lot of things already there today, which is good news. But I think we'll see even more um, on the opportunity side in the future going forward. Okay, and I would like to stop here and we would like to end with a, with a nice mental image of a big European white greenhouse flourishing and we all having a space uh, technology celebration party there in the greenhouse as Uli was mentioning. So thank you very much honored panel and I think with the people like this we are going to be in the top of the world very, very soon. Or actually in many areas we are already. So thank you very much for your advice here. Thank you very much for that wonderful panel. Thank you so much. I, I have a greenhouse 45 minutes from here. You're all warmly welcome to work there whenever you want. Ladies and gentlemen, my favorite panelist here was definitely Uli. It wasn't, it's not just because that she's the, she's the woman with all the money. Uh, 
but uh, she prioritizes fun. And now, ladies and gentlemen, in one hour in this room, we are going to be having a lot of fun. We will be giving uh, the Master's Award, the Copernicus and the, the, of course, the Galileo Master's Awards in a ceremony starting one hour from now. These are the Space Oscars, ladies and gentlemen. But before that, it is time for some good fun in the form of a cocktail just outside the door. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow, 9 o'clock. Thank you.